We just did some, you see, we complicated our lives with more ropes. And the reason is because, well, we're not, it's just like friendly competition in front of us. These were our neighbors uh, that left in the morning just before us. And it's the Lagoon 42, so it is the similar size ball. It's a little smaller, but the speed is very close. So now we're trying to get, you know, every knot out of our sails. So that's why we did this. So this is basically, this is what you use for the light Genoa, the, the front sail code zero, which is furled now because we have too much wind. Now, by using this rope, now you can see that the shape of the sail is kind of beautiful. The telltales are kind of working and we gained uh, more speed. Now, without this rope, see, it's not so good. So, well, I shouldn't be showing you now because we're gonna lose speed. But anyway, let's see what happens if you don't have this rope. So let's uh, release this slope. You see, suddenly you get this ugly shape and then uh, you see, it just doesn't work. So I have to tension more see to get kind of shape but obviously this is not like it's not what you want to have you see it's like backing too much it's you cannot really you know up there it's open too much here it's closed too much you see it obviously doesn't work so now I'm gonna set this rope and now I can release like this and tension the green line a little bit more Okay, see how nicely the shape, uh, you know, now developed. We can go a little bit more. Okay, you see now, it looks like a sail. It looks like kind of the wing. So still, uh, you see the original, uh, this gray one is still in use. You know, you can control kind of the angle. Uh, but then the green one is now making sure that the sail, you see, it's not like too much twisted backwards. And then it also closes the top. And that's how we gain more speed. Uh, it's like the difference is, you know, like 0 0.3 knot or something. And we're getting closer and closer to the Lagoon 42. So we are obviously a little bit faster. Now these boats, you know, like it's a good comparison. It's not like we're a lot faster. Like what I'm looking right now, uh, he has the mainsail open too much, way too much twist. So I think they could set, you know, the sails a little bit better and that would, you know, help them uh, with the speed. And then we have done uh, this trick with the Jeep, which is, you know, adding a little bit more speed. I don't think they've done that. So we are like a little bit faster. It's not a big difference, uh, but it's a good comparison between uh, Lagoon 46 and the 42. So I think if uh, like we would set the sails equally, you know, it's like pretty much, you know, similar speed of these boats. It's not that much big of a difference, you know. Uh, like this one, because the hulls are a little bit longer, like should be probably a little bit faster theoretically, but we're talking like 0 0.12 knot. It's like, it's not like it's one knot difference, but because of the setting of the sails, we are now a little bit faster and probably should get to the Vs uh, quicker. Yeah, so right now, because the wind went, apparent wind from 90, a little bit like under 90, and they haven't changed the setting on the mainsail, right now we are like much faster. It's uh, very obvious and that we are faster. Now, what we did with our sail, we tensioned the main sheet quite a lot. So we closed the upper twist and we have the sail way more in than they have. You can see like they have the sail like all the way here and the upper part, you know, just open twisted, which is just not perfect uh, for these angles. Lagoon 42 is already far behind us, like a big difference now. But we have a monohull here, right? So it's kind of a collision course. So who has the right of the way? And it's not who's bigger or who's faster, but right now we have the sails on the left side of the boat. And if you look carefully, that monohull has sails on his right side of the boat. So that's why we have the right of the way, because we have sails on the left side. Now, if we both had the sails on the left side of the boat, 
the one having the right of the way is the one that's like lower from the wind. So the guy that's upwind has to give way because he has better wind, because we are like theoretically in his turbulence. So again, now we have the right of way because he has sails on the right side of the boat, we have on the left. But if we both head on the same side, the guy that's upwind has to give way to the boat that's downwind. So this guy seems that knows the rules, which is just not the thing with loads of charter boats. Now this you can see it's privately owned boat, uh, so they know a little bit more, but many times uh, people don't know the rules or they turn them upside down. So that's why there is a rule saying you should do everything to avoid collision. So it's not like you have absolute right of the way. Uh, uh, you know, because the boat might be in trouble, it's maybe, you know, people fell off the water. So on the sea, there's this rule, do everything to avoid collision. So if, like, this boat wouldn't move, then you're ob obliged to do everything, you know, to avoid. Uh, but uh, there's another thing, you know, you shoot, if you have the right of way, you shoot your course steady. Because if you start doing left, right, left, right, then the guy, who should give you, you know, the right of the way, doesn't know what you're gonna do. So when you have the right of the way, just stay on the track, you know, keep your heading, observe the other boat, and then in case he doesn't move, he's getting really close, then move, because, you know, you wanna save your life, and it's also the rule. Uh, but definitely, you know, don't start doing left, right, left, right, because you're gonna confuse that guy, he's not gonna do what you wanna do. We're now getting close to this, so it's just one mile, and it's time to put the sails down. Now, we're having, so, 40 knots of true wind speed, which is not much, you know, it's kind of perfect. But what is the strategy to put these sails uh, down? Now, we could do it, you know, just like right here, of course, uh, it's easy, but we're going to use a little bit different tactics. So, we're going to go all the way in here, into the bay, because the winds are like this. And that's how we're going to have less waves and less wind. Uh, now, you can sometimes mess it up because the wind can channelize through some valleys. But I know it's good here. So, yeah, instead of putting the sail down here, we'll just go in here because it's more calm and less wind. And then, as we've talked already, to put the Genoa down, I'm going to turn downwind. Now, many people turn upwind and start furling it. It's much harder, more forces, doesn't furl nicely. I'm going to turn downwind and then uh, start, of course, the engines, and then you reduce the apparent wind speed, and then it's super easy, you know, just to furl the Genoa. And the same goes for reefing. If you're reefing, you should be reefing, you know, sailing downwind, much less forces. Then once we have furled the Genoa, we're gonna go upwind, because for the main sail, you can only put it down going upwind. So we're gonna have, use engines, you know, go upwind, and then just release uh, the ropes, and then we're good to go. Well, let's put the sails down, hopefully not mess it as it usually is when there's a camera. So the first thing, I'm starting the engines and we're coming to the bay and the wind is already, you know, dropping. There's less way, so that's why. Okay, let's start the engines. And I'm going to put them just in a gear. And now I'm going to go downwind. As I go downwind, I'm also opening the sail. Always make sure, you know, there's nobody behind. You have enough. Uh... Okay, so now the wind is like pretty much from behind, which is a good start. Now this rope is going to furl. It goes all the way around to the sail and it's going to furl the sail. So I'm using the other winch for this. You have to put it nicely, otherwise, okay, I messed it up. Has to go. These donuts have to be really nice, otherwise it can get tangled. This rope is a little bit tangled. Okay, so once this is set, I'm going downwind. I just opened this sail a lot, and it's so easy to furl it. Then uh, always double check on the furler that the rope is not has like fallen off. We've talked about that.
Okay, all went good. So it's so much easier because I went downwind, like there's no forces. Uh, the sail got furled uh, super nice. So then we remove this one. And then we're gonna go upwind into the bay so we can get ropes ready for the uh, mainsail. So now we'll have to pull this small one as we go because it's pulling the sail down. Uh, there's a lot of pressure now on this uh, halyard. This is the main halyard. And it should be set, you know, because it's nicely coiled in. So it should be good. Now, you cannot really open the stopper. Uh, so it's better to put a little bit pressure on the winch and then it's very easy to open it. Otherwise, it's kind of hard. So now I go standby. Use a little bit more power and put the boat kind of upwind. Also gonna center the traveler. Okay. So I'm driving a little bit more because there's a bay and uh, you, know, you need enough space, you know, you don't wanna start doing it here going upwind you like have to make sure that you're gonna have enough uh, time uh, to do it properly. Okay. So it's not necessarily to go like directly upwind. I'll show you there's a trick you can do. So I'm gonna engage autopilot now. To keep enough throttle that uh, the, the autopilot can handle because in strong winds you know it's gonna push you left and right. Now we're like more or less upwind now, but uh, actually not. So I'm just gonna release the main sheet a little bit, you know, to empty the sail and it's gonna, you know, the sail is gonna align. And then uh, we're ready to release. Okay, we're actually in a little bit trouble because the autopilot seems like has problem in these winds, we're also getting close to shore. So these are all the issues. Okay, a little bit more other direction. And now I'm releasing the halyard. It's good to have gloves and pulling the small rope. And if there is no, is the, if the sail is not catching any wind, you see everything goes super nice and quick. So in the end, I released it kind of quickly because otherwise in the last end just tends to, you know, get stuck kind of. Okay, so I'm now pulling the main sheet and I have my uh, boom lift preset from earlier, so it just works, you know, the boom didn't crash to the roof. And now I'm in a little bit hurry because I'm really getting close to everywhere so quickly, you know, making the most important things. And then later I'll have to hook uh, uh, the halyard around uh, the cleat, as we've seen before. And pack everything, make it nicer. But right now I'm actually quite in a hurry because uh, uh, there's a bay. So I'll do these things later. And now think more about the sailing. Now when you're in a hurry like this, you know, you can forget some important things, like a rope can fall in. So, like there's a small buoy in front of us. It's a fisherman's net. Uh, very easy to get in a propeller. So kind of with experience, you learn what is important to do immediately and then uh, what can wait, you know, a little bit until you get anchored or, you know, like putting a cover over the boom. Uh, you can just do it later, right? So this bay we're coming in. So this island, this used to be a military island. So it was not allowed to come here. And we're now coming to this uh, beautiful bay to see the tunnel where they used to hide submarines and rocket boats. It's just a tourist attraction these days. Uh, but yeah, just a great place. So then you can find them after the deep of time. Another beautiful day in Croatia. So we're gonna go over from this uh, going down to far. And now we expect kind of these uh, day winds, but not very strong. 
so we can just either engine or just use this uh, motor sailing you know on a catamaran you can put the sails and also maybe just one engine so it's motor sailing and works uh, really well so you burn uh, less fuel but you still have the speed because the sail is helping you now we have this fancy light genoa code zero and we're just gonna open uh, this sail now and then see uh, what happens so we have nine knots of true in speed the wind is from behind so the thing is that Apparent wind speed is only eight, you know, it's less because if the winds are from behind, you lose wind. But still, this should be enough you now to help us. Uh, so what we're gonna do is, because we use engines, we are producing wind, so apparent wind is from here, right? So now I'm gonna slow down, and now I'm gonna produce less wind. So this apparent wind is gonna slowly come, you know, closer, and it's gonna be easier to open the sail. You always want to open it kind of downwind. Okay, like from the beam it's okay, but it's better, you know, uh, downwind. One person here who's gonna, you know, just take slack out, just pulling gently, but I have to unfurl in front, especially initially from the beginning. Okay. So you're gonna be, you know, pulling this as I go, but you can just follow me. So you're not pulling, I'm the one opening, you're just following me. Okay. Okay. And to unfurl this sail, we use this line. And then I'm just gonna unfurl it, put this over. It's very easy, it's good to have gloves because if anything goes wrong, you're working with the ropes. So initially I have to help, but then once it catches the wind, I'm gonna basically kind of uh, control the opening. You know, if you would just release, it would crash open. So with gloves, it's very easy uh, to control it. So it's, it's just a great sail. It's, uh, I mean, I just love this sail. I mean, more and more, it's, it's perfect. And I'm saying this version, you know. Not just the Code Zero, but uh, like Light Genoa, and especially this model, it's so... Is that good? Yeah, so now we're gonna put in this, uh, okay, to tension it. Uh, so you can see the sail is very... Uh, uh, has no wind. Okay, so I'm winching and now the sail is gonna catch the wind. As I go. Okay, it's looking better and better. A little bit more, the telltales are kind of happy. I'll go a little bit more. Yeah, looking good. So now let's see what is the speed we get if we have no engines. So right now we're on four knots, but it's probably gonna go down. So four knots. Oh, so we're actually doing four knots, uh, which is pretty good. It's pretty good, yeah, four knots. Uh, but because we have a long distance to go and we have to be there by time, actually drop now under four, uh, we're gonna give, you know, a little bit of, uh, so I'll go this one, a little bit of, and turn this one off. And this is motor sailing. So we're using one engine a little bit and the sail. So we have the speed and uh, we're burning much less fuel and uh, mostly we look like we're sailing. Everybody thinks we're sailing, although we're not. So it looks good. And the thing is now, because we have a sail, we're not a sailboat, we're a motorboat because we have engine on. Now we should put the sign, which nobody actually does, there's a cone showing down that we have the sails, but we have engines running, so we're officially a motorboat. Uh, so if there's somebody sailing, he will think we're sailors, but then it means we're cheating because we have an engine. Now, nobody really, like I haven't seen a single boat in Croatia in the last 10 years, like putting that. So you just have to figure it out because if there's a boat who has a sail, but it's moving way too quick for the amount of the wind, it's obviously using an engine, right? But then some people will think, okay, I have a sail, I'm a sailboat. So there's this rule, you know, always avoid collision. 
and that's the most important rolling ratio. When you see a bow, just run away. That's the number one. Okay, now we're on five knots, and this is going to be our motor sailing. Thank you. Well, we're going to furl it for now until we get better wind, so... There's two ropes, you have to pull the right one, uh, just because the sun protection is... Uh, UV protection just from one side. So we're going to be pulling this rope. Okay, this one. And we don't want to shave it uh, over this one, right? So just yeah, pull from here. But uh, as I start releasing, okay? So we'll be pulling and I'm going to be releasing the... Are we pulling it back? Yeah, we're furling it back, yeah. This was just to open the sail, air it. And then usually I go from here, because you want to control how nicely it's furling. So the guy pulling, uh, actually the guy right here is more important than the guy pulling because you have to control, you know, how loose, how tight it's uh, first. Let's go. Yeah. So he's pulling and I'm just keeping just the right tension to make the sail uh, furl nicely. Make sure that it's uh, turning. So I really want to just, you know, to furl it very nicely. Then in the end, you put a little bit more pressure so that uh, it's more tight so that it wouldn't open it. Uh, keep going, keep going. And I'm going to make up. Keep going. We're going to do a couple of loops. It just seems like this is a good idea. Okay, thank you. That's perfect. And then we always want to make sure that this is... Uh, in a stopper, otherwise it can open again. Okay. And then we need to put this rope somewhere safe. Also to make sure there's a little bit of tension. You don't want to let that open and this open because then the sail will open. Uh, so both ropes have to be secured. Now it's a good time to start the water maker because we're running both engines and we have a really smart water maker that when running two engines we can run it via inverter. Uh, although the water maker is uh, 220 so we don't have to run a generator and because we're running the engines anyway, you know, why not make water? Some people buy 12 volt water makers we have now fixed this problem, so it was basically just a clogged filter and just way too soon somebody was running it in the marina. As long as it's green, it's good. When it gets red, you need to change the filter. So then slowly build up the pressure. Yeah, this is a really good one. We have a 2 kilowatt uh, inverter, which makes, uh, so from batteries, which are 12 volts, like in your car, it makes 220, and this one is 220. You can have a 12 volt, but for some reason they're not so like good. It's better to have a 220. But then we run it basically from 12 volt batteries when both engines are running. It's, it's super cool. And this one produces 100 liters per hour, which I think is uh, you know really good. And it's uh, one third of the price of the normal one, so very happy with this one so far. So now we've set the pressure on green, uh, we're producing water and now just waiting for water quality, which means salinity is low enough, it takes a minute or two. And then you switch to the tank, so now we're diverting out back to the sea until the salinity is good and then we'll go to the tank. Now you can check how much water you have here. So we're now 44%, which means we can produce another around 350 liters. Everything all together, we have 600 liters. This is fuel one tank, fuel other tank. So this one is lower because the generator is running from this one. And we've been running a lot of ACs during the night. So that's why so much more fuel from one tank because generator is connected just, you know, to one tank, which is kind of stupid. Uh, okay, and then here we'll produce uh, the water. So here uh, you can see, uh, so we are, you see, we're using 1.2 kilowatt, which means that the water maker is, that's all he's using, right? 
And basically, in the end, the result is uh, we're just using from the batteries uh, six amps. So the engines are producing the most of the power and only taking six amps from the batteries, which is not much. Now, the solar panels are not really working because they're in the shade. But if we had solar panels on the sun, uh, then we would uh, produce, uh, you know, positive. It would be really great. Okay, we have a green light. Let's switch to the tanks. We're here, we're good. A little bit more, you can push it like... But then keep checking, it doesn't go to the red. You can uh, destroy the membrane. Okay. We're now uh, lifting the anchor up. So the thing with this thing is it, uh, it always kind of gets uh, jammed if you put too much in the same place, you know, the chain well. So now, you see, with, if you don't have this, this is kind of really kind of awkward. So put this because it might fall on your head, it's a bad design. So then the chain well is all the way in. So once you, if you drop a lot of chain, let's say 60 meters, 50, and you're pulling it up, it's gonna get like in one place and hit to the winch from inside. Now there should be a hole or something, you know, that you could, you know, put the chain down. Now on this boat, in most of these lagoons, you have to go in and then pull it down with hand. So I'll show you in here. It's basically now it's already down, but you see the chain is gonna go in the same place and eventually hit into the, into the, you know, the winch. So it's not the best design. But now we have only 20 meters left and we have enough, you know, like buffer to do it. And let's film there. So now I'm going slowly forward. When I'm going forward with the engines, not pulling the boat with the winch. I'm using the engines to move forward and just take a slack. Now from here, I don't see really well what's going on. So the person in front is a vital you know, to help you, but then with experience, you kind of figure out, you know, how it works. But yeah, be careful, you know, not to put uh, too much chain uh, and then hit the winch. You do have to go in with the hand and, you know, kick it. Now, because I don't see well, the person in front is going to tell me when the anchor is out. I mean, I have a chain meter, but still, uh, it's good to have a person there and then to tell you if the anchor is turned around correctly. This is the safety because these winches get crazy and they just release all the chain. Now you put this up so that in case uh, the winch gets crazy, this is going to hold uh, the chain so you're not going to lose uh, the anchor. So now we're drifting so also we have to keep an eye not to crash somewhere, because the anchor is gone. Now this Y, I just hook it here, and then put it around. So this was previously attached to the anchor, to stabilize the boat to put the effort off the chain. And now let's close this. Always use this for the safety. It's kind of annoying, but... Okay, close this. We're good to go. Thank you. Yep. So there is one control in here for the anchor. So you could use this one. Uh, but then you cannot be at the same time at the helm and using this. So you would need one person, you know, to really coordinate, which is fine. But then if the crew is not so experienced, this comes very handy here. So this is another remote, also a chain meter and that's going to help you a lot so you can have a control over the boat and the anchor but always have a person forward you know watching for these problems where the chain is going direction of the anchor you know guiding you with the hand okay now let's put we have nice winds 50 knots of true wind speed let's put the gloves it's good to have them usually i don't have them but now i just keep them here uh, so, I'm gonna first put off this rope that's holding the boom from swinging left and right. And 
Then I'm gonna get the halyard ready. So I open it and I'll hook it from here, pulling immediately so it doesn't get tangled. Okay, take a slack out. Now I hope this time it's gonna go like, you know, like a boss, not like last time. And if everything went wrong. So make sure I have enough power on the engines. Set autopilot on wind. Wait until he gets in direction. Check if there's any boats around. And then, don't forget the small line. It's just like, not all the boats have it. So you'll, uh, it's easy to forget. More spaghetti. Ah, mamma mia. Okay. Open this. This is gonna go nicely, okay. Check if you're upwind. And now let's hope this time things go smoothly. So two buttons are good. Now the third one, you see it's out. So have to wait a little bit. I'm gonna release the main sheet. That's gonna help a little bit. Okay. Okay, we're past. I'm gonna put it on the winch. It's getting heavy. Now I have to keep it from the on the left side of the boom lift. Okay, this time we have a steady wind, so everything is going very smoothly. Reefs are not causing any trouble this time. So looking really good for now. Okay, almost at the top. Now we go very slowly. You must have your uh, main sheet open now. Get the right tension. Okay. Close the stoppers, close the main sheet. Bring the traveler to the center. Pull main sheet a little bit more. Now we turn 40 degrees to this side. Main halyard slowly release so that uh, the winch, I mean the stopper, grabs it nicely. Taking now the rope from the jeep. Okay, taking the black line, which is the furler of the Jeep, opening the stopper. And now I have to control the opening. Okay. Opening the Jeep now. Okay, I close the stopper of the black line. Tension the sail, keep enough slight pressure on this black line. Take uh, wind angle, this is a parent wind angle to 35. Still under wind autopilot. So now we're good to turn the engines off. Okay, now we're sailing 6.5, a great sailing day. Now, before I finish the rope, make sure the ropes are not in the water. Check the sails, mostly looking good. Center the traveler. And now it's time, check the boats. Now it's time to make this mess nicer. And let's just do it the right way. We have time, so we get the ropes how they should be. Put this one away. And now the halyard. Uh, let's take some time and do the things properly. 
Now, if you take time now, then later there's much less work. Although, it seems like we tend to be lazy and skip this process too many times. It's good to have gloves because, see, I'm like much faster with the gloves and I don't damage my hands. You can see they're all worn out or I have this for many years, sand line. Like, they went through a lot. I'll need to get new ones. By the way, sand line. Best selling equipment, been using it for 10 years. Great stuff. These shirts, like, they're just amazing. Sun protection, dry quickly. Have several, like, mostly wear this. And this is it. We are officially sailing. It's a good job. Thank you, Cooper. Yep. Our camera guy does the job again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're lucky today, so everything went smoothly like a boss. Mm -hmm. Like previous time, everything went wrong. But that's good because that's how we learn, right? Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to film everything perfect. We have to show the mistakes. Yeah. Well done. This is great sailing day. We have 13 knots of true speed, which is perfect. Full sails. Uh, we're just sailing up, you know, going to this place. Far. Uh, perfect conditions. If you get too much of these day winds, you'll get waves. Uh, so this is just perfect, you know, the speed is good. And we have, uh, you know, see, nice smooth uh, waters. Now, I have my wind autopilot set to a parent wind angle. So, of course, you know, why are we not hand steering? Well, these boats are like tanks. And you're not going to, I mean, you can hand steer, sure, romantic, you know, blah, blah, no autopilots. But in the end, you're going to use autopilot. On the monohull, you're going to sail with the hands because that's really, really fun. Now, on catamarans, these cruising ones, it's like a tank. And then to go upwind, as we've talked so many times already, you want to keep it sharp and slow. See, we're doing now four and a half knots. We could go way faster if we went, you know, bigger angle. So you sail more downwind. But now we're pushing it, you know, far up. And this is how we're gonna get there um, much quicker in the end. Down there, Lagoon 42 going downwind. They're feeling super lazy today. They could at least open the Genoa, you know. In these winds, they would save the fuel. Uh, but just like taking it easy, super lazy motoring downwind. Why would you do that? Open the Genoa. At least it looks good. You get some shade, use less fuel. Anyway, now the setting of the sail, so we have a traveler in the middle. Uh, main sheet, it's pretty tight because we want to close the top of the sail. On low winds, you want to have power, so you tension the main sheet and you close the upper part, so no twist. And then uh, we have the, gen the jib tensioned a lot, you see. Try to figure out these telltales. Now, these are kind of happy telltales. Up there, a little bit less. But in general, you know, with the self-tacking, you can get these telltales uh, normal, you know, parallel, upwind for all the other angles. It doesn't work. And just, you see, like, slowly sailing upwind. Beautiful day, beautiful day. So we're using the small sail. We're not using the big uh, light genoa because we want to, you know, go upwind and there's also a lot of wind. So, if you really want to go upwind, you know, sharp, don't, we cannot use the code zero, you know, like, like Genoa. You can go only 50 degrees uh, apparent wind angle. And right now we're going 33. So, you would use, you know, like 17 degrees. So, it wouldn't be very efficient upwind sailing. But then, uh, for all other angles, if you have low winds, uh, then you open, you know, the big, the big uh, master sail and then you pick up loads of speed. It's more than twice the size of this one, so it has a lot of power. We're sailing beautifully, and down there, there's a boat coming, collision course. So they have no sails, they are on the power, so of course we have to ride away. But don't forget about the rule, you have to prevent, you have to do everything to prevent collision. Now, that guy might be sleeping, drinking beer, or he fell in the water, or has no clue what he's doing, so even though we're sailing, you want to keep an eye on them. There's loads of kinds of people sailing around, so, you know, you have to think about yourself. Don't count that everybody sees you. Make sure, uh, you know, to move if it's necessary. 
Okay, so now he's moving. He went 10 degrees to the his port, so all is good. Uh, but if he wouldn't, you know, very quickly he'll crash. Sometimes people put autopilot, they just go to do a sandwich and suddenly, you know, they crash somewhere. So you need one person uh, keeping a watch all the time. Beautiful clips and just a perfect beach in front of us. Well, but we'll have to turn, otherwise we're gonna be dry. So what you make sure is now, I make sure I'm sailing really upwind because I have to, you know, maintain speed. I have a lot of speed, so it's gonna be easy to turn. I check around, is there any boats behind me? You know, you don't want to turn when there's somebody just, you know, overtaking you. And then once we're ready, we're gonna go manual, stand by, turn the boat a lot quickly, and just tack. Now we're going upwind, so self-tacking is gonna tack. Also the main just tacks alone. But yeah, let's just do. So I go stand by, take over, and now I'm gonna turn the wheel a lot quickly. You don't want to do this slowly because you're gonna lose speed and you might not make it, get stuck in the wind, go reverse and get in trouble. Now this self-tacking just goes alone across. So it's actually good, you know, for self-tacking, but everything else is just sucks. But what we're doing right now, it's actually, it's kind of handy, you know, otherwise you have to pull two ropes. And now because we're just lazy, let's engage, set, oops, and set this autopilot to 33 apparent wind angle and now he's gonna sail us upwind nice and efficiently. So why do you want to sail upwind before turning? So if you're gonna sail more downwind and start turning, you know, you're gonna slowly lose speed. Uh, the rudders are actually turning and also slowing down the boat. So you might just, you know, run out of speed and be stuck upwind and then go reverse. Uh, so you want to go upwind, but still you need a couple of knots of speed. If your speed is too low, you know, you're not going to make it. So you need like, you know, a couple of knots, you know, like three knots should be, you know, plenty. We had six. And then you turn the rudder, you want to go quickly. If you go slowly, you're going to lose the speed and get stuck upwind. So turn quickly, tack, and keep going. So now we're uh, going to take a buoy. Now you can see this. these two buoys are too much close because it's from different restaurants which just cannot figure it out you know who's gonna have a buoy where yeah. and uh, yeah. we'll have to figure out something or actually we're gonna go all the way in yeah and yeah, there's another one from the restaurant because that's too close yeah. so we're going in and we're gonna grab a buoy so I'm slowly getting close. Now the problem here is that I don't see the buoy. I mean, I see, but then once the buoy is under the boat, I don't see really well. So I have to figure out if I'm moving forward or backwards, you know, like keep in place. And that's what I do by watching in the water or watching uh, ashore, you know, then I see if I'm moving or not. Now it's really helpful if somebody forward is also helping you to, you know, tell where the buoy is and then say stop or go because the helmsman just doesn't see the, where the buoy is. I just try to do my best. And then we're gonna hook it and go to the middle cleat, which is not the strongest one, but it's kind of cool to do it this way. And then add the side ones. So coming to the buoy, I really wanna go slowly, as slow as possible because if you have too much speed you won't be able to be precise you're going to be too fast and go so you want to get close to the buoy a line and then go like meter by meter so you like put a little bit speed have a full control of the of the boat get close and now i don't see the buoy like i see it a little bit but now i'm losing the vision so now i'm watching other points like shore or water to try not to move too much forward and not to go too much backwards because then they won't be able to do the thing. So this part is quite tricky for the guy on the helm, especially if nobody's uh, telling him forward what to do. But our crew is now well trained and they did a pretty good job.
Okay, very good. Yeah, and then we go with the one. It's all good, but we'll do this one, you know, to finish. Just looks nice. Yeah. Well, it's also useful. Tightens it down. Is that good? That was a good job, yeah. So, like, the first time you were like experts already. Not bad. Yeah. Now we're gonna move to peeling potatoes and brushing deck. <laughs> <laughs> Tying to the buoy can be a big challenge, especially in strong winds. We've done a pretty good job, so this crew has done this first time, so pretty proud of them. So the thing is, you see, the helmsman has to go really slowly towards the buoy, meter by meter, and then has to have, you know, some visual point to know if you're moving forward and backwards. So look at the land, you know, stop the boat, don't move forward backwards, because otherwise, you see, if you're gonna go over the buoy, the buoy is gonna go there and the line is gonna be too short so the guys cannot pull it through. If you're gonna go backwards, you know, push by the wind, then again, the buoy gets tangent. You cannot, you know, do the ropes. You have to really, you know, like uh, be exactly here and keep the position of the boat, which in strong winds is a pretty challenging thing. Now, we're again using this middle one, which by the lagoon is not supposed to be okay, not strong. Uh, but now the thing is, it's gonna be a very calm night and we're gonna swing a lot. So if I put ropes on these cleats, then I might damage these Dinema lines, which are now covered just with a water hose to you know, avoid uh, chafing, abrasion. Uh, but again, you don't wanna you know, put force on this, you know, especially not from this 90 degrees, because you just might you know, break all the uh, Code Zero rig. So now you could put on those original cleats, and then the line's gonna fall down, Go under the boat, but then you're gonna, you know, you know, damage a little bit the anti-fouling. So there is no a good solution. It's all improvising. So for this bay, because I expect at night variable strong winds from all directions, the boat's gonna move a lot. I just kind of keep it here. You know? And as long as there's no strong wind, this is good. And the buoy is not gonna hit into the boat. Now, like you know, you could put it just, you know, to that cleat in light winds, just, you know, single line there, then the buoy is gonna hit into the boat and you won't be able to sleep. Now, another problem here is, you know, the challenge, once I have this, I don't wanna touch, you know, these Dinema lines. Now, we're good now, but in very strong winds, you know, you would want to let more rope up because, of course, the, like, the better the angle, you know, the less force is produced to keep the boat steady. If the line goes straight down, see much more force you need, and uh, then the block inside has to be heavier to hold the boat. So strong winds just want to go, you know, far away, like that boat has a lot of line. But now again, we expect light winds, so this is good. Now, if I put more rope, the angle goes up, and then this rope is going to touch, you know, the green hose in the Nema line under, which is going to produce uh, high forces, not good again. So, you know, it just seems like it's a big challenge, not just to grab a buoy, you know, put everything through because you're pretty high, not all the buoys are, you know, good. And then just, you know, tying the rope, it just seems like for every bay and every wind conditions, I'm just choosing different method. And I just think this should be straightforward, like the catamaran charter catamaran should be like super easy, straightforward, how you do it. Fortunately, it's not, but hoping in the future designers will uh, figure out something, you know, to make life uh, easier. So we have a can in here, see, a Red Bull. Now it's not easy to get it out, but we figured out the trick. My cameraman. So we're gonna use a hook and a sophisticated material called duct tape. So theoretically it should stick. Now I go fishing in. It actually works, uh, you see, and it's, um, and it's, you can use it for more Red Bulls, you see. There's, uh, I think there's another thing in there. Okay, it's great for the, not just for the drinks, it's also for the uh, crackers. And you can reuse this, it's uh, eco-friendly. Good stuff, we'll just keep it here. And then we'll put this in the trash. We had a great sail upwind, so the winds are here, and this is our track. 
the consumer went, oh, tick tac tick tac tick tac tick tac tick tac around the island, now we're here. Now our destination is here, we go to this famous Arsenal restaurant. Now, so we have to jibe, you know, jibe, which means we have to turn down there. So the sails are going to go on the other side, of course, because the wind is blowing like this, right? So the challenge with the catamaran is that when the jibing, uh, it's very difficult not to break the mainsail. You can see the mainsail is huge. So now when it goes across, it's going to do just like bang. Uh, not much problems with the jib, but the mainsail is very, you know, tricky. So there's uh, different methods how to do. Uh, so there's always, uh, you know, one of the things you can just, you know, go upwind and, you know, tack or jibe. Now to jibe, there's a couple of methods and uh, we'll show one uh, how to do it. Okay, so let's get ready. I'm going to show you how, what is the safest way to do a, the, a jibe. Now, of course, there's always this method that you, you know, we're now going downwind, that you start going upwind, you know, so slowly tension the sails, go upwind, you know, and then tack and come back down. Now, in very strong winds, you might don't want to do that. It just depends, you know, but going up is definitely the safest if you're thinking about uh, the mainsails. Now, going downwind, you know, you can be just like a charter guest who doesn't care about the boat and just turn the wheel and everything goes bang, you think it's going to explode. Or, especially in strong winds, uh, this is one of the best methods. It's using the engines, I know. Uh, you can do a similar thing without engines, but I'm going to show you how to do it with the engines, which is uh, the safest thing. So you're crossing an ocean, Bay of Biscay, you know, you want to go like really, really sure uh, it's going to be okay. So we want to, you know, make apparent wind speed smaller. So that's why I'm just going to, you know, pick up speed. And also with the engines, the boat's very stable. If you're doing this without engines, you know, the waves are kind of turning and you can mess it up in the wrong second and just goes bang. So having engines on is actually making the boat very stable. And I'm going on a normal autopilot. It just seems like it works better. Now I'm gonna tension the jib. I don't need a jib actually. So now the more the jib is in, uh, the less you know it's gonna bang. And then uh, I tension the main sheet. So the main sheet is the one holding the sail down. I tension it quite a lot. So we can take a look there. So I'm gonna tension it quite a lot. And tensioning the main sheet prevents the sail to be too flexible and to do that puff, you know, like tsh. So it's, uh, you know, way easier. Now I'm gonna center the, the track behind. I put it in the middle. Now I'm relying on my engines for speed, okay? And then I'm going to keep, you must have gloves. So I just keep a couple donuts here. It depends what kind of boat you have, how many donuts. But the idea is that once the sail is going to go bang, just at the right moment, I'm going to release this, which means I'm going to kind of, you know, uh, make it softer for the sail uh, to go across. Okay, so now I'll give a little bit more speed. And now very slowly, I'm going to start going in a, in a jibe, which means turning downwind. Now, this is not a problem, you know, you just forget about the jib. I'm just like looking at the sail, feeling the boat, listening. And then when it goes over, I really have to release this. Uh, we're close. Okay. Okay, this was a very nice one. Also not much wind, and then you can reduce the speed and go you know, back on course. And now I'm just going to tension this back a little bit more, the main sheet. So we've done the tech, now we have sails on, uh, you know, on the other side, everything is good. We can uh, set the sails for a new angle, so we want to go more upwind. That's where our bay is. So this is it, basically. Now, uh, we didn't see what the sail is doing, but it's not really important, you know. 
The thing is, you want to reduce the apparent wind speed. The less the wind speed, the less the bank. Uh, the more speed, the more stable the bow, then slowly go and then use the main sheet, you know, when the sail goes across and then just release, you know, it's like a car, you know, like having the, how's it called? The suspension or no suspension, right? So this is basically a, a suspension. If you're going to do this, uh, you know, in strong winds and not think about it, you just might break the buttons, everything might uh, pop out. If you're not sure, uh, you can always also furl the jib because downwind it's very easy to furl the jib. Start the engines before that, of course. So start the engines, furl the jib, and then just you know do a tech upwind, come back, open the jib again. That's uh, another method. But definitely don't just turn the wheel uh, when having the mainsail open a lot, jib sheet released because it's just gonna go zoom on the other side and uh, yeah, just probably break everything. Okay, here's our bay now, we go to Arsenal, the best restaurant around here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah gloves are a great thing and these ones have been through a lot, now you can see. I've had this glove for years, now you can see that, uh, you know, this would happen to my hands. You know, and like, let's see this one. This one is a little bit better shave, but, uh, but yeah. They've been through a lot of sailing and uh, it's really good to have gloves. So how do you, you know, go in and out of the dinghy? Well, the rule number one is never disattach this before you go in or the engine is running. I mean, I'm gonna break this rule because I trust this engine. But uh, anyway, there's a great method. So you hold this rope, see? And this is my, how to say, like a stick. And then I just, you know, gently stick in. And basically this is giving me a balance. Always hook it here. I'll start engine now, but you know, always make sure engine is working before. But this is Yamaha, it's really good stuff. Now, one of the methods is uh, that you go directly, but your dinghy has to be protected. It's not my favorite method uh, because it's not like, you know, the nicest. But if you have a very nice surface, it's like a pier, and you have a fender, see, you could like slowly approach and then just keep the boat in a gear. And you see, just steer with, uh, you know, put some power and just steer towards the boat. And it's very stable. Now I have to be careful, you know, because the boat shouldn't go, you know, over anyway. It has to be like a very nice uh, contact. But this is like very easy and then people can step in. Well, I'm not a fan of this one. So what I do is, uh, I like this sliding version. So what you want to do is, you don't want to come from this side, you want to go directly in. See, I'm coming in a big angle. And then uh, just before I'm there, I turn the engine, swing, turn, catch. You see, it's uh, super easy. Now I'll show you what's wrong if I don't do this. So I see, I see many people coming here at the angle like this, right? So they go all like this, which also works, but then you have the speed and you have to stop the boat. No, it also works. But I like this sliding version, so I'll go again. Okay, so let's go again. I'm approaching the boat directly. See, like very small angle. And then I start sliding slowly, turning the boat, and then you just catch. Okay, this one wasn't so good. But the idea is, you know, to go in, turn, and slide in. That's the idea. And then there, this is this power turn. So let's say you want to turn very quickly, like you can go slowly. Uh, but with these dinghies, it's really cool. So if you just uh, put more power, you can do quite a quick turn. See, it turns much quicker. You go towards the boat, you turn, and you just slide in. Okay, so the idea is, you know, to kind of slide in. There we are. So, how to board people? Once you're here, you want to have a very firm grip, and your shoreline has to be firm. And then people 
just grab the shoulder and step very nicely in like the ballerina, not like an elephant. If you go like ballerina, it's easy. If you go like an elephant, you're probably finished in the water. Okay, so we'll demonstrate how to go in like a ballerinas. Okay, so I'm ready. So my shoulder is, see like the point everybody's using to get in nicely. See, and it's super easy. This is one of the best methods and nobody has ever fallen in. It's like the best thing that... <laughs> so again, going in, you know, take the rope, use it, use it as a stability, and breathe, you know, just step in. So this is Yamaha, you can only do this with the Yamaha, otherwise uh, always start engine first before you... So to go off the boat, I'm holding the rope. I get speed towards the boat. I shut down the engine. Again, holding this, push the boat away, and you're here. So the key is to have enough speed to bring you to the boat, not too much. Stop the engine, slide in, and then when you step off the boat, you know, push it away so it doesn't hit the boat. Bring this rope with you, and then you clip the boat. So it's so easy. Okay, so the plan. We have a little bit wind from here. We're gonna do that back line first, and then that mooring line, okay? okay? And then we'll go to this side uh, to finish. And we can just lean nicely on the on the pier, so it's gonna be easy. So we don't have much wind now, but I can already see that tomorrow this is not gonna be easy to go. So we'll have to wait until people leave. It's gonna be kind of... Um... A da idem ovdje bočno da mogu jutro izaći? So, I want to go to the other side. So this is like, they built this Croatia uh, marinas years ago. So now, yeah, let's film, let's film there, so we see. So it's now, it's gonna be tricky to go out. It's now easy to go in, there's no wind. But obviously until the boats leave, we won't be able to go. But of course everybody will leave anyway. We're lucky, no wind. And it's a very nice pier, so I'm gonna just, uh, you know, I have the fenders on the back. So if we don't really mess it up, it should be just fine. But obviously you can see that getting out not possible until everybody moves. So super lucky, you see we have one boat on the side. And we have a very nice pier behind. No wind. So we can you know, just take time and dog the boat slowly, no hurry. And I'm just gonna slowly lean to the pier behind. Gently stop the boat. You can see in the cameras. Okay, now the mooring line goes. Very good. So let's see. Yeah, fix this one. Let's quickly fix it. Yeah. Okay, now I have this tool, uh, one line fixed, and the boat is going a little bit left. So I used a little bit of and now we can fix it. It's just not, not oh, These measurements better later. So now we're more or less, you know, kind of safe. And now we have to do other stuff. Uh, 
Nie jest to nie przyparany. Hola. So you can see here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So it's good to have fenders behind. If no fenders, then you probably crash the boat. And it's important to pull the mooring line uh, as you go, because otherwise you're going to pull the wrong end and might get in the propeller. Okay, so I'll do this. Put on the motor, so that's in the lomim. Okay, so now I'm gonna use the engines to go forward. Uh, but I always have to check for the mooring lines. Okay, so once everything is good, I'll put engines forward. Just in the gear. The boat is gonna stay on these two lines. And I can tension the mooring and tension backwards without breaking the head. So now... Oh, you can feel me because I'm not there. Okay, thanks. Boat moves forward, you know, and I can tension this now with much less stress. And just like, see, as much as I can, I can see there's kind of a chain or something down there. See, there's no need like to pull the boat because we're gonna go backwards now, pushing forward with the engines. Okay, now again, always double check in the back, not to get anything in the propeller. So now I'm gonna put, just in the gear, reverse. So now putting in the gear reverse, checking how close we get. Okay, and now I take slack out. A little bit more. See the other side. Seems like we're lucky, we just nailed it in the first shot. Now this distance should be just enough to put a plank. Well, we can stop the engines now, so we don't burn the fuel, so put in the neutral. Stop, stop. Now let's see how the plank is gonna fit. Opa. So we use this one a little bit better, but then sometimes it just doesn't fit. Most of the people in Croatia just use the wooden planks. They're not the best, they always fall in the water. The best is to have hydraulics. Maybe not a good idea on the charter boat. So these are the floating pontoons. They stay in the same line. It's way easier. So you can see, obviously, this boat cannot go out until we go, that's enough space. And then the boats that are gonna come here cannot go, we cannot go out until they go out, but it's all just, you know, day guests. But that's the thing in Croatia, marinas are small, so they just, you know, squeeze you in. That's how it is. So it's very good to use this method with engines because some people pull the boat you know, they pull the mooring lines, they're back. No, just, you know, 
make it a little bit more loose uh, behind. Go forward, tension, mooring lines gently go backwards. The question is then, you know, how much distance you want to have and how much do you want to tension the lines. Now this depends from marina to marina. Uh, each has a, you know, like very specific, uh, you know, and from the weather. Now, you see, this is like a good distance. My plank is fine. I'm far away and I'm pretty much tangent a lot now because we don't expect any swell, no winds. So that's, you know, the boat stays still and the plank doesn't move. Now I should put, you know, some springs to the rope going from there here and from here there, you know, so it prevents going left and right so that the plank doesn't fall. So just, you know, yeah, put the rope like this, you know. Although now we have these lines at quite a big angle. So now this line is also kind of, you know, preventing from both going uh, left and right. But then again, not so much. See, angle is like more forward. You want to have spring, you know, like at this angle, you know, like much more sharper than uh, this one. Now, if you get a lot of swell, you know, it builds up, the boat is going to start you now going forward and backwards. If it's going to be like this tangent, uh, probably everything will break. And then also this distance, you see, it depends how the mooring lines are. You know, if they're on a chain, if they're going to stretch and there's a big wave, it just might hit in, you know, sometimes this is not enough. So then sometimes people use springs here or sometimes the best method is just to have ropes very loose so the boat is, you know, working. But then again, sometimes it seems better to have them tangent a lot because the rope itself is stretchy, right? So the rope, still, if it's very tangent, it still works, you know, it's still stretchy, it still, you know, uh, does the job. So, you know, how much tension, what's the distance, the time is going to tell you. Uh, sometimes better to do it like we've done it now, sometimes better to, you know, make it more loose because you can, you know, break the cleat very quickly. I imagine the wave comes, the boat goes up and down and then just, tsk, tsk, you know, so then the springs are good or those rubber, you know, springs, which usually break very quickly. The, the, the metal ones are way better for over a winter. This plank is good because it just stays fixed there, it has these wheels, you know, just rolls. Now this is a floating uh, pontoon, which is just like the best for these guys. But then, you know, if the pontoon is very high or, you know, like, and then this board might cause some trouble, but mostly it works. So now we have uh, 60 knots of wind coming to this marina, which is super small. So it's going to be a little bit more challenging. So Mike, the plan is, the best plan would be to pass one line, get it back, fix it, second line, fix it, and then I can give, you know, engines forward, we have time for this. So let's do one, another one, and let's keep the distance of three meters. Okay. Three meters away, that's like... So Jack, we, each of you will do one line, get it back, fix it, and keep three meters, and then we'll do the 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 mooring lines.
Okay. Yeah, I want to do it like three meters away now. Okay. Do we have another line? Ovo imamo već. Ne ovo. Okay, uh, give a little bit more slack. Uh, this one, a little bit more. We're only three meters away. Three meters from... Uh, Yeah, we're only three meters away. This is meter and a half, okay? So gently go away. We want to go three meters away from the dock. So slowly. He's tied on already. Yeah, okay. Jack, loosen that. There you go. Very slowly, huh? That's your fingers. Okay, good. How much? Fix it, yeah. Cool. Okay. Is this one three meters? Okay, okay, this is good. Good. Stable. Okay, I'll help. Okay. Oh, someone to take me, but you want to send us. To, super, samo da motamo. Ok. Now we'll go reverse. Ok. Evo ćemo sad nategnuti, da. Budemo... Zavozim napred i onda nategnuti tamo mure. Ali ne, ja me ovaj strašno vuče tu. Da možeš porlaskat snijevi dok to radi. Ili, znaš šta ćemo? Sporo ćemo šprint bacit. Hoće me... Ne, bar će me tamo, da vidim. Ali dođe, ma. Da vidimo. Dobro, napet. Dobro, napet. Prepiše. Malo ćemo za to. Ti moraš na onome konopu podnuti cijelu silu, a ne na krmi. Dobro. Dakle, ti bi trebao popustiti. Dobro, bude nam popustio. Da, da, da. Na tebi ga ima se vratit nazad. Ali ćemo još prije nego paru da se ja mogu na njoj. Se vrtim. Evo, Jure, daj mi ovaj, zaveži tamo, da me bar ovaj drži. Ja sam se odljepio od njega već. Kako izgleda? Da ga još. Ne, dobro. Ali bi trebalo se ipak malo zavozi napred na tegni pred i 20 centimetara. I on se samo malo vratio rikvač za noga. Može, može. Može. Da ti to sve ravno, da nisi ovako. A nije loše sad, ali dobro, može. Ok. Evo, izvoli. Hvala vam mnogo. Hvala, hvala tebi. 
This is the wind history, so you can see the winds were like averaging 15, but going up to like almost 29 gusts. So this is when we were docking the boats. We had winds from 15 to 25 uh, from uh, this direction, right? And actually this was uh, very easy docking relatively for these winds uh, because we have winds coming from the side. So all I had to do is come in, turn the boat, you know, come here and then lean on the boat next to us. So this was very easy, uh, relatively, uh, but it could be much more tricky if there was uh, no boat. So basically we just uh, came in and I was holding the boat still. Uh, we did the lines, then the guys from the charter company jumped up, you know, with all kinds of ideas how to do the ropes. Then we figure out what we're gonna do. We move the boat a little bit more upwind because that's what they wanted. So now we are good. So even in uh, like you know, these strong winds, it can be quite easy to dock uh, the boat. Now the challenge was actually the biggest challenge was see I was coming in forward uh, and I had to turn the boat here. So I saw there's enough space, so I just went forward. Like I could also choose to go backwards, which might be in stronger winds smarter. Uh, but then again, these catamarans are very hard to go to steer backwards. But then again, in stronger winds would be probably smarter. So here I could decide, you know, to turn uh, like bow down or bow upwind. I decided to go downwind, which again, not always necessarily the smartest thing because when you put engines reverse, they're much less efficient than going forward. Now then again, if you're, you know, bow downwind, you're reverse and then uh, for some reason the bow tends to go downwind easier than upwind. So in the end it's uh, you know pretty similar, you need a lot of power. Uh, but then again if we had like 45 knots, I might not have enough power to turn the boat quickly so it would be much smarter to reverse in and just you know go directly to the spot. All as we said catamarans are not easy to you know go backwards especially here with this flybridge. You don't see much, but well, it would be smarter in this situation. We anchored in Blue Lagoon. Now we need a little bit more sun uh, to get the colors out. Uh, but you can see there's, it's a very popular place. Loads of boats that are yeah, a little bit overcasted. But if sun uh, shows up, this really turns into the beautiful swimming area. It's very shallow here. So how do you anchor when you have so much boats? around you. So there's a kind of the rule that you always anchor behind the boat or actually so if you see like there's a monohull and a catamaran uh, I would drop anchor in the line on the back of these boats in the middle and then you'll finish here. Now the trick is you should know where the other boats have the anchor. Now uh, if there was a, like a strong wind like earlier we had it from this direction uh, then you know where the boats have anchored. If there's not much wind or there's currents. You see, our anchor is actually not there. Our anchor is actually down there. And the boat is just, you know, hanging on the chain. So now when somebody comes in and wants to anchor, uh, so he might be in trouble because he might anchor there thinking everybody has anchors on this side. But actually he anchors here and then when the winds turn, it's going to be just next to our anchor. So it's very important to know where the, every boat has an anchor because that boat might have an anchor here or might be there and the boat just, you know, turned. So it's good to know what winds were here when this boat, like, you know, try to figure out uh, where were the winds coming when this boat's anchored. Also the length of the chain, you know, some people put way too much chain, some people put not enough so they drift, some people put just right. So you have to figure all these things. Also, if the winds come from that direction, all the boats are gonna swing, you know, like around to this side. So you have to think what happens, you know, when you turn around. Are we gonna hit that boat and how much chain do they have? So like these two boats are, you know, really close right now. But I guess, you know, well, this is, yeah, it's too close. So let's just think, uh, you know, we're far enough. So if we turn around, that boat is gonna finish there. We're gonna finish there, so everything's okay. So the boat has this turning circle around uh, the anchor. So that's what you have to think about. But like a general rule, if the boats are, you know, set correctly, 
uh, that like there, uh, you know, there was less strong wind from one direction and you're sure that the anchor is then in front of the boat because it has to be, right? Then you just anchor like behind and it sometimes looks scary because you have to come very close to this boat, drop an anchor and then you'll finish, you know, much more uh, behind. Uh, then some people on the other boats don't like, they think like you're gonna stay there. No, you won't, you just drop the anchor there and you're gonna drift because you have to drop like 20, 30 uh, meters. Now, I really like, like dropping, as I've said, uh, between uh, the boats. So let's take a look here. So this is our boat and we have a catamaran there. Now this looks like a nice spot. Now you could drop it directly behind that boat or directly behind our boat. Uh, that's what I don't really like. What I like doing is to do between. So you put a line between the back of that boat and our boat and then in the middle somewhere, like there, you would drop the anchor and then, you know, go to the other side. Or uh, let's take a look. So where could we anchor? Like, see, there's like a spot in between. But right now it's everything is confused. You see, that boat is turned this way. This one is turned this way. Uh, down there, the Nauti Tech is turned this way. And so where is the anchor? And that doesn't make sense. So when you come into this uh, lagoon now and you want to anchor, it's actually tricky. So it's actually the only way that you figure out where the anchors are. And here, because it's very well visible, it's a beautiful lagoon, you could just, you know, go around and figure out where the anchors are and then anchor appropriately. So it's much easier to anchor when there's like, you know, quite strong winds, because then you're sure where the anchor is. Uh, but when it's like this, it can get pretty tricky. So many times, you know, people come to this lagoon and they just drop anchors. Nobody's thinking about a lot because there's, uh, you know, no wind. And then the winds pick up and then all the chains stretch and then, you know, then you get a mess. So anchoring is actually very, you know, easy, but you have to think about this thing. So it's mostly, you see, this boat has the anchor, let's say it's here. So this is like the turning circle, you know, this boat is going to turn. But also the other boats, like this boat is also going to turn, you know. Now, if this boat is on the buoy and this boat is on the anchor, they might hit because the buoy turns just a little bit. Uh, but this boat is going to go far more. And then again, uh, yeah, you have to think about the chain. So let's say, you know, this, uh, let's say think about these two boats. And then if they're going to turn to the other side, which means the winds would blow from there. Now, if the catamaran has very, very short chain and the monohull has a very long chain, when you turn, like it could happen that they're going to hit because, you know, they're going to stretch more than the catamaran. They have a bigger turning circle than the catamaran has a very uh, small one. So definitely a funny situation now the catamaran is moving. So this monohull came the last and now uh, the catamaran moved because he's smarter. And the guy on the monohull is just uh, too ego to move so it just happens all the time. But the catamaran was just smarter so they picked up the anchor and left. Well that happens all the time. There's always a guy who comes in, drops an anchor and then his ego is too strong, you know, to re-anchor. So just be smart and move away. That's the best you can do. Uh, so the catamaran, you see, just moved a little bit forward. You know, took some chain out, although he was first, so the monohull should definitely move. But then the guys on the monohull, now they just disappeared, you know, like pretending, hey, we're not here, we're like, we're not here, you know, nobody sees us. And we have anchored in this beautiful bay, like the nicest water you can get. So we've dropped, uh, we're anchored in three meters and we have dropped around 10 meters of chain. And I'm gonna show you how it looks underwater. I'm using these small fins. They're mostly probably from, they're from Decathlon. They're used for swimming, I think. And actually uh, super fun to use. And then a mask, this one's actually pretty good. Now what you have to do, what you have to do before going, you have to spit in, otherwise it's fogging. So you have to spit in. And then you have to, see, like, spread it. Then you wash it. And then it's not gonna fog so much. Uh, now, when the mask is new, it might fog a little bit, but then eventually uh, it stops.
just anchored in this uh, beautiful bay here. It's four meters deep. Uh, we have dropped 16 meters of chain. And let's dive for it uh, to see what the anchor did. So I dropped the chain, I went a little bit reverse uh, to dig it in and we'll see what happened underwater. We're sailing uh, towards Wyss. There's not much uh, of the wind, but still we have this uh, big light Genoa up and it's uh, motor sailing and it's helping a lot. It's one square uh, meters and we have a little bit wind from the side, but actually it does uh, improve the speed and lowers the fuel consumption. So we have true wind actually from behind, but because of uh, we're using engines, apparent wind angle goes forward because we're producing wind and uh, so we have uh, 5.3 knots of wind speed similar apparent and uh, we were going under six earlier now we're going over six so we have a higher speed because we have a sail and also the overall consumption uh, went down so yeah we could just uh, we could actually have now both sails you now like main sail it would help even more, but it's kind of, you know, hassle to put the mainsail up. So like many times you would just, you know, open the Genoa. It's just like way easier. Uh, so yeah, we could open yeah, uh, the Jeep, which is half smaller, so it would give uh, much less uh, difference. But because we have this great uh, light Genoa, or some people call it Code Zero, uh, we can have uh, this one up because it's way bigger and produces a lot more force. Now this is a beautiful sail, as I've said, because it's not too deep. It's basically a light Genoa. So we can go, you know, also kind of uh, upwind and you can go 50 uh, degrees of apparent wind angle. So right now we are on uh, 56, so it's kind of the edge. But you can see it's performing uh, beautifully. Now uh, many code zeros and sails look the same, but they're too deep. So right now they wouldn't be useful. So when you're buying this sail, make sure uh, also to ask your sail maker for the you know shape of the sail. This sail was made for us by Supreme Sails. So these guys are really good, very flexible, and yeah, this is where you can get this sail, and you can choose different shapes. We're happy with this one, using it a lot in Croatia because we have these light winds and also for motor sailing it's just a perfect sail it's great for downwind it's great for upwind it's just great for everything just uh, life is way better now with this sail another uh, beautiful bay we anchored so it's pretty calm so it's around six to seven meters deep and i dropped 18 meters of chain now i didn't really go reverse with the boat you know to dig it in so there's not much wind so i kind of dropped it went slightly you know back uh, laying chain nicely on the ground and then just you know stopped the engines i didn't you know go reverse to dig it in so let's see now what happened you know uh, so maybe because uh, there's some wind the anchor digged but it might be just laying you know like somehow uh, which means because there's not much wind that only the chain is enough you know has enough drag to hold us in the place so if uh, the anchor is you know just like anything that means it's all normal you know just gonna take time until it you know digs in it has to turn that's how they're built for uh, but then again on days like this when there's not much wind sometimes you just don't have to bother too much uh, with that although probably you know you should but in light winds the chain alone you know is gonna kind of hold you just the weight of the chain and anchor alone without uh, you know anchor uh, digging in so let's take a look
anchored in this uh, super nice bay and we have put a line ashore there's a super cool uh, tunnel it was for the rocket boats and submarines from Tito Army anyway uh, we have dropped the anchor see out there uh, it's around 8 meters deep so we dropped uh, 30 meters of chain and then we reversed in and when we came there was zero wind now we were expecting the winds to change to day winds so coming from this direction but when we were you know doing this it was really calm so we just reversed back here and it was so calm that you know we just sent a swimmer to put uh, you know that loop around the rock and we just kept the rope see on the boat so we you know just let the rope out swimmer goes puts around and then we tangent We have anchored in this beautiful bay on Island Brach and uh, there's a trick uh, how to anchor here. So the bay you see it's quite short so what we did is we dropped the anchor all the way on the other side and we it's only six meters deep but we dropped 30 meters of chain. So what you want to do in bays like this really drop it all the way on the other side you know and then reverse and dig the anchor you know so like drop if it's six meters drop like 10 12 meters go reverse dig it in and then keep dropping the chain so the more chain you have the better it is the less chance uh, it's gonna slip because in bays like this uh, the winds shift and very quickly you get you know side winds and the rocks here are very close so the more chain you put uh, you know the safer you're gonna be the better hold uh, you're gonna have so let's uh, check an anchor to see how it looks here Anchored in this uh, beautiful bay, this is uh, Kirknashi and it's actually only two meters deep here. So how did we anchor here? So, so we are anchored here, uh, Dervenik, Kirknashi, you can see it's very shallow and just by looking at the map, see it says two meters here, one and a half here and 0 0.6. Now this is the lowest water, so on the chart it's always like the lowest lowest that can ever get. So usually you would have a little bit more water so in Croatia there's maybe a very little tide maybe 40 centimeters but it does make difference on anchor just like this so right now it says two meters okay now the question is it really two meters you know like there's sometimes you know it says two meters but from where it's measuring two meters from the keel from the hull or from the surface so it's not very important when you're anchoring like very deep in 10 meters but when you're anchoring in the lagoons like this where it's you know very shallow it's uh, very important to know how accurate your depth uh, meter is so the best way to do it is to dive in because now we know it's two meters so i'm gonna dive in and check how much space there really is under the keel and i know for this boat that I can actually go like under one meter, although we have a draft of 1.6, which means that there's some, you know, reserve just for the people uh, not to crash. So I'll dive in later and you'll see. So two meters is supposed to be the depth, uh, but then you'll see what the depth really is. Another thing is I have dropped 20 meters of chain. Now it doesn't make sense, right? Because before I already said that you need to drop three to five times the depth. So we have two meters, so theoretically that would mean six meters or maximum 10 meters for very high uh, winds. Now it just doesn't make sense, right? Why did I drop 20? So there's a thing, when I'm anchoring in depths like two, three, four meters, I would always put minimum 15 meters of chain or 20 because you want to have that weight. You know, I would never drop just six meters. It doesn't make sense. Although in theory, as we say, three to five times the depth, that would work, right? But in the practice, you don't want to really do that. So I'm going to dive in also to see 
our anchor, uh, like how it is. There's a lot of grass around and you don't want to have your anchor in the grass because it's not going to hold really well. So you really want to look for the spots with the sand, uh, which I was not really lucky to get here, but I knew that it's going to be a very cold night. So that's why I didn't complicate much. Like down there, you can see spots which would be much better. You can see like, you know, the bright spots. This is where the sand is. So you would ideally drop uh, your anchor there or, you know, just make sure how it is what I did yesterday diving. So now actually we have the chain, 20 meters of chain, the anchor is down there. So it's a very low angle, you know, a lot of chain, uh, but that's how I would do it in this. So let's dive in and see how it looks. Another beautiful spot that we anchored. So we have anchor and two lines ashore. The water is just beautiful. We are on island of Vis. So these two lines, uh, so it's not always too easy to put them, you know, because we have these uh, loops. So you need a rock that just fits. Like uh, with a longer chain, it would be way easier to do it here. Uh, but these loops kind of float, so it's easier to carry them uh, ashore. So now you can see this angle. See, ideally it would be bigger. See, this rope should go more there or this one, you know, far more there. But we knew it's gonna be a very cold night. And then another thing is I've put them on the one cleat. I'll explain later why. Uh, but anyway, you wanna have this angle bigger. Sometimes like our neighbors, they only have one line. It was a very cold night. Now you can see that their line is just wrapped around the rock and then it's actually crossing a small uh, rock so this is like very dangerous the rope will get damaged sooner or later and that's what I'm trying to avoid so if you can see our lines I like tension them a lot because I want them to be tangent and not drop in the water and then hooked behind the rock and then you know tension so you should take uh, you know care how you put them you know these are very sharp rocks now the anchor is uh, out there somewhere now there's a tricky thing you see this um, so the, the terrain really falls quickly. So here we have around four meters, but we have dropped anchor on, uh, I think around 20 meters and we dropped 55 meters of chain. Uh, but the good thing is, you know, when the terrain is like this and the anchor is here, your boat is up here, you're basically pulling the anchor and the chain uphill, right? So it's a way better than pulling it downhill. You know, it makes sense. So I feel very secure here, although the, you can see it's mostly grass. So probably the hold is not the best. Uh, it was too deep and I couldn't actually find the anchor because it was into the grass. So I would say, you know, like very bad weather. Uh, not perfect because you cannot check the anchor. Well, you can check, you know, if it's holding just with the boat. Uh, but anyway, you see like this terrain helps a lot, you know, sleep better because you have to pull everything up. And also the angle of the chain uh, how to say, it just, you know, it's just better. It's like we would anchor in much shallower water, although we dropped on 20 meters. So we've put these two lines just on the one cleat uh, with the reason, because when the boat goes left and then goes right, so there shouldn't be anything, you know, 
in the way of your line. Now, if you put a line here, obviously, it's all good if it goes this direction, but if the line for some reason would go this direction, you know, the boat moves, you're gonna damage this. So it's just kind of a bad design here. I think the cleats should be, you know, here and open to all the direction. Uh, then we could use the one on the other side, but we have another problem because the stairs are here. See? So if for some reason the rope is gonna go this direction, it's gonna bend your stairs. And then this, uh, uh, this cleat here, again, the same problem. Like, it would work if we had these lines, you know, using these, uh, these cleats, but then the rope has to go really far out and far there. But then in case, you know, one rope would fall off, which happens, and the boat would go, let's say, that direction, then you would uh, bend this, uh, and then you would bend this because, you know, the rope would go like this. So that's why I kind of like this cleat, because it's like, you know, 180 degrees safe. But then again, putting two ropes on one cleat is not the best, right? But then again, these cleats are strong, so uh, they should hold. So we have sent a swimmer with a loop and dropped all the rope into the water. On the end of the rope, we attached the buoy. We dropped everything in the water. Then we sailed out, dropped the anchor, reversed, make sure it's tangent, you know, like it went reverse, so we see it's like holding. And then the swimmer brought the line to the boat, we attached it to the boat and we're good. And then we went out for the second uh, line. So it was actually pretty easy, the challenge is, so it was actually pretty easy. The challenge was, there's a lot of sea urchins and sharp rocks. So you have to be really careful when putting the rope on the rocks. But what a beautiful place, it's uh, well worth it. We have anchored yesterday in this uh, beautiful bay. We have one line here, second line going there, and the third one safety going like this. The bay itself, uh, well, it's just unreal. It's a high season now. This is a place which uh, like most of the people never ever heard or knew it exists. There were two more boats in the bay and we have an anchor and we dropped the anchor just behind those boats. So we have a lot of chain. We have uh, 30 meters of chain, although it's only three meters uh, deep. How did we anchor? We came yesterday with the day wind. So the day winds would be going like this. And then we were expecting uh, these winds in the morning and during the night, which are south winds. So they come from here. So that's why we choose uh, this bay, because it's, you know, well protected. You can see outside there's probably around 15 to 20 knots of wind in the channel. But here uh, it's just right. You know, it's very warm these days. So that's why we anchored here. We're sheltered. So coming in, it was very easy because we have these day winds and we use them in our advantage. So uh, we wanted to be all the way in as possible, as shallow, because this is the you know top place. Now, I would usually drop anchor exactly where those boats are, uh, but we didn't want to annoy them too much. So we went a little bit closer, dropped it a little bit behind the boats. And because we had the day winds, all we had to do is drop an anchor, see? let the chain out and then the boat is going to see it like this because the winds are uh, pushing it and the boat is stable so then we have a lot of time to put uh, the lines so once the boat was anchored we have a lot of time you know to take uh, the lines out because the day winds were just you know from the right direction so we took the first line put it around the rock you see it's like a good angle and then we took the second one down there, which is pointing directly upwind. You want to have, you know, this angle high. So that's why we took it all the way down. Now we do have a third rope, which is just a safety. It's not actually in use. And I was lucky to find a hole in the rock. So I just made a bowline through the rocks and this is the safety. So why do you need safety? You never know. The rope might break, you know, it might slip off the rocks. It might, it might cut. Uh, so you never know. Uh, so if the main rope, this one that's going upwind, would like, you know, wouldn't work anymore and we only had the second line, then the boat would go down because the wind is pushing it. Now, if this happens, we would be risking, I uh, see, getting ashore too much because you see this angle? So the boat would have to go all the way down so that this rope would, you know, hold it against the wind. Now, you're not sure exactly what's in there and uh, 
the chain might stretch differently, you know, the anchor might, you know, turn, so we might hit the rocks. So we do have two lines, but, you know, actually this is, uh, you know, not a safety line. This is just, you know, keep us in place. So that's why we put the third line, which is just safety. So in case any of these two ropes uh, would fail, uh, this one is somewhere in the middle, so would keep us uh, in the place. Uh, so it's probably you now overkill, but you just you know sleep better. With three lines, you're sure that uh, nothing's going to happen. Although the two lines are usually enough, and many times we would put just a single line, but with three lines, you're going to sleep uh, much better. So now, because the winds are coming from here, we're basically pulled away from a shore, and that was the idea. Yeah, let's say we would get really, really strong winds. Like, I would love this place, maybe put another line for the safety. And you see, the line can break, but it cannot drag. And the rock is probably not gonna break. So we can have super strong winds and we're pulled away from the shore. And there's no waves because we're protected. So this is just, you know, a great method to survive uh, high winds. Now the anchor is actually not doing much because uh, the wind is from the back of the boat. So let's see. It is tangent because we tangent it uh, with, uh, you know, going backwards to the boat and then tangenting the ropes. But the anchor is not doing much. There's very little force on the anchor. Like if we had winds, you know, like the day winds when we came from this direction and very strong winds, all the force would be on the anchor. And if the anchor would fail, you see, we would crash to the rocks. But now having three ropes on the back, we're being pulled away from the shore and this is uh, like the coolest thing uh, you can do. When we were dropping uh, the anchor, so we dropped a lot, went reverse, you know, tried to dig it, uh, but very gently. And then I went uh, for a swim. So everything looked good. I went for a swim and I saw the anchor is not all the way in. So this ground here where we dropped is kind of semi-hard. So it's like on top, it's a little bit soft, but seems like hard under. So the anchor wouldn't dig all the way in. So I wasn't really happy. So I use the engines and like gradually reverse, you know, to put more tension to like hope to dig it more. Well, actually at both engines reverse at 1500, we started slipping. So the anchor couldn't go deeper uh, because of the ground, but we just slipped. Uh, but then we just left it like this because we were expecting south winds and the 1500 uh, RPM reverse is a lot of strength which we were just not expecting to, you know, have it tonight on the anchor. Now, if we were expecting higher winds or, you know, higher forces on the anchor, uh, this wouldn't be good enough. We'll take a dive later to see how it is. So I would just, you know, re-anchor somewhere there. But, you know, you don't want to re-anchor, you know, all the time. So if you're sure about the winds and uh, you have enough, you know, strength, on the anchor, you might leave it like this, although, you know, much smarter to redo it and really dig it well, uh, especially if you're not sure about the winds that are coming or you're not familiar with the area. Now, looking at these two boats, you see, it's not the best strategy what they did because they have a wind perpendicular, right? And if they watch the weather forecast, they knew the wind is going to be like this. So this is the worst position ever you can do. So if they would be hit by very strong winds like this, the surface area of the boat is huge. And the strength on the anchor is enormous if you get winds uh, from the side. Now, I went yesterday, checked their anchors, and they were super lucky because they digged it really, really well. The ground there is just amazing. They dropped a lot of chains. So, I mean, obviously they know what they're doing. Uh, but I was a little bit concerned, so that's why I checked their anchor. But yeah, they did it really well. So they put a lot of chain, dig the anchor. Uh, well, I'll swim later to show you the anchors. And they're like all the way in the ground. So even though, you know, the method, you know, is not the best because, you know, they're putting a lot of forces in the anchor, the anchor is digged really well. So they would probably, you know, be okay even in 20 knots of wind or more. But again, why would you do that? You see, you never know uh, when you fail. So for them, way better would be to do the same as we did. So drop an anchor there. You see, you have a boat here and then put the lines ashore so that you're pulled away uh, from the shore. Uh, but then again, you know, they're okay. The winds are light. Uh, so it would be better, but this was, you know, good, good for today.
another beautiful day sailing with our light Genoa from Supreme Sails and this is like this is why I love this sail because we're going straight downwind and without this sail it would be just a struggle you know and it's so easy to use just on furl furl uh, I'll show you here so we have uh, so we're sailing here from Shchedra to Hvar we have uh, so 70 knots of true in speed apparent width speed is 10 so with this sail we can go up to 16 apparent wind speed so we're well, well inside the limits and our speed you see is 6.5 it's really good we're going straight down wind you see apparent wind angle is 172 so going so going straight down wind see if we only had uh, if we only had just a small jib this would be a disaster we would need to put another rope on the cleat as i've showed because the self-taking just doesn't work uh, downwind and then the surface area is too small then uh, we could open you know the main sail but because we're going downwind uh, the jib would be you know in the shade so we would have to zigzag it would take way longer uh, with this sail see we're just going straight downwind having no trouble great speed and so much fun so light genoa is the way to go and this one i like it more and more this one from the supreme sales i've said this so many times but i really like this sale it just works so these are the guys who made this sale amazing material durable has a little bit of sun protection so we can keep it up uh, all the time and also we had it furled uh, in 30 knots of wind speed and didn't move because some light materials you know it will get uh, damaged so just so much fun sailing downwind and if you're going to be crossing an ocean i mean without this on the catamaran you're going to suffer a lot i've done it one i don't want to do it again now you can have the lighter materials which are just fine as long as they don't break now this is good line also for slightly upwind downwind easy to furl durable so you definitely need a good uh, downwind sails on these catamarans the normal sails uh, they don't do it now as i've said hundred times in my videos crossing an ocean you want to have a parasail and a light genoa but if you only choose one i would go with the light genoa some people call it code zero so there's a big mess with with expressions so let's just make it simple this is the small one which is furled this is a jib it's a small sail now if it would be a bigger one we would call it a genoa you see it on all the monohulls like many boats have so jib is small genoa is bigger now what we have here we call a light genoa because it's like more or less you know similar uh, just the material is lighter so light genoa and it's made for light wind so light genoa and this is the expression I like to use and again uh, it's Genoa because it's not very deep you see this sail when we pull it all the way in we can go 50 degrees apparent wind angle which is you know almost like Genoa Genoa would go you know like 30 33 uh, but 50 is very good for the downwind sail we're in this uh, beautiful bay on Brach so we have two lines see behind uh, so this one could be at, at a bigger angle again uh, this one is good angle and this one we put uh, on the tree So now this is the how you should do you know he dropped the anchor all the way on this side and he's gonna put a line on the other side and that's how you should do it now he's going back too fast see uh, so he just did a small mistake because the anchor chain you know doesn't go out as quick as he's going backwards so he might be an old dragging the anchor uh, okay now it seems like the anchor is kind of holding yeah so very good so that's what you want to do you want to drop anchor there and then you want to reverse 
but just like uh, from the beginning until you drop you know two times the depth you should go slowly because the chain just you know needs time you know to unroll so now he stopped putting the chain off you know just to you know uh, dig it in a little bit now he keeps going with the chain but you can see the chain is going out you know very slowly so probably everything is going to be okay okay you can see the chain is it's a pretty good hold so it's good so everything's going to be okay uh, so uh, like he went everything well you know he goes here uh, just should go slower but anyway because he was all the way here and he went a little bit faster still you see the anchor is probably somewhere there and still has plenty of uh, chain in the water you know so this was uh, how it should be well done now they have to get a line ashore so what we could improve right now is so we have a good anchor uh, but the angle of this line is not the best right for these winds uh, it's not the best so this line should be you know further up and then it would give uh, much less stress uh, on the anchor another thing is what we can do we can just you know lay it out a little bit so the boat is going to swing more there and then it's going to be you know less effort on the on the chain because you see if it's like this you need much less force to pull the boat out but right now it's also pulling the boat backwards right so you want to have it like this uh, like actually straight up wind and this rope of course not doing anything so because we are far away uh, initially now i can put this line you know like release it a little bit so you can there's a lot of you see strength a lot of force on this one but now as i'm releasing the boat is going to see more downwind and the angle gets uh, much better now as we have released the line uh, in the back also the boat went a little bit forward and then the chain is now going like this so the wind is coming from here and this is actually kind of good because you see like it's less force in the anchor if you tension anchor straight and the back line straight so you're going to have a lot of force so you want to have both you know pointing a little bit upwind and the line in the back and the anchor and then you have just uh, you know the bigger the angle the less stress there's going to be on the you know anchor itself so it's not going to drag We have 70 knots of true wind speed going downwind and we have set autopilot directly 180 and we are sailing wing to wing uh, with a catamaran. To do this you need to set a couple more ropes so we're using uh, this one as a kind of a preventer and also the bank so what we did is we opened the main a lot actually too much put in the shrouds you can do this only for a short amount or shouldn't do it all then we tangent the black line the blue one actually and then we tangent the main sheet and that's how we keep now the boom more open without the sail going to the shrouds so this is like bank and also a preventer in case we mess it up that the boom doesn't go across to the other side which would cause a lot of uh, like forces and wear and tear uh, potentially you know lose the mast now the Genoa, because this self-tacking is really bad, we're using another rope, you know, to keep it more open and also to prevent it from, you know, collapsing if uh, the wind changes a little bit or the waves push the autopilot off the course. Uh, we're actually sailing Genoa upwind. So on the monohull, you can do the same, but you're gonna sail, you see you need wind from this side. Now on the catamaran, you need the wind from the other side. It doesn't make sense, I know. But because the mainsail here, you can only see open the boom that much. You're actually using the wind to bounce into the main and then push the wind towards uh, the jib. On the monohull, you would open this uh, boom all the way out. So you wouldn't have this effect of, of passing the wind to the jib. 
So that's why you sail upwind with the jeep on the catamaran. Uh, that's how you get more surface area on the main because you see it's more exposed to the wind and it's also giving air to the jib. It's uh, kind of funny because you can go like 10 degrees, you know, more upwind, which doesn't make sense because uh, see the wind is from this direction and the Genoa, the jib should collapse, right? You know, but it doesn't because if we said the wind is bouncing from here and going forward. Now, if you're gonna try to do the other way around, you know, going to the left, uh, you're gonna have more trouble and less speed. So it's very funny that on a monohull you do the same thing like the other way around, but on the catamaran you do it like this. We're now sailing so 180 and we're talking about the apparent wind angle. So now let's see, let's go 170. So now we're pushing the jib upwind and it's uh, not gonna collapse like theoretically it should, you know, because the wind is from that side. See, it doesn't because the main is uh, giving air. And also the speed, it doesn't drop because now the main is getting more air because the wind is more perpendicular to the mainsail and the jeep is still getting the air because all the, se all the wind from the main is bouncing into the jeep. So let's go another 10. Uh, this is probably maximum, it should still be okay. So we're 160 apparent wind angle. See the jeep still, see? It's kind of funny because we're really upwind now. Uh, no problems. Now, if we go more, uh, the thing doesn't work uh, that well anymore. So now let's try how much we can go to the other side. So we'll go back to 180. And wait for the autopilot uh, to get uh, in a position. See, the sails are still uh, stable. So now let's go 10 degrees to this side. So on the left. So the jeep should still handle it in this angle, uh, but going 20 to this side uh, probably doesn't work well anymore. Now, if we keep going this direction, there's always a danger uh, that the main, you see, we have this trouble. Okay, this like what you shouldn't do but it's a good example. So now this is how the preventer works. Now the boat is off the balance, so we have to quickly correct. Uh, and now the autopilot is beeping. And yeah, this was uh, <coughs> luckily not much wind. So now the main is gonna bang backwards. And this is a great example why I don't wanna do this. You see all the forces? So right now it was right now it was still kind of safe because we only have in our 11 knots of apparent wind speed. If you're gonna do this in higher winds, you're probably gonna break the buttons or something. Uh, so what we figured out is that we can go kind of downwind. Usually it also works in this direction, uh, but like you can go 20 degrees more uh, to the other side. So what we've learned is that you can go 20 degrees to that side, it's safe. Usually you can go 10 degrees here, but for some reason, uh, maybe the wind shifted or uh, the autopilot messed it up, the wave, you know, pushed us. So that, uh, you see, the wind came from this direction and, you know, turned uh, the main uh, to the other side. Now, if you do more reefs, and if I would shorten the, you see, the, the blue line to open the main more, uh, it would be safer. Uh, but anyway, what we've learned is that by having a wing to wing, you have around 30 degrees of uh, maneuverability. So that's good to know. So you should like check, you know, when you're sailing, how much you can go left and right. So when you have to, you know, uh, avoid something, you already know in advance. So right now I know I can go 20 degrees to this side, uh, but seems like 10, well, I probably wouldn't want to try it again. Uh, but usually like 40 degrees is uh, what you can, you know, maneuver. That's your uh, maneuverability angle. We're now flying wing to wing, code zero and the jib. Now we should attach the jib back to the cleat, uh, but it's working even with this self-taking. So this is so cool. So if you're crossing an ocean, the winds drop, 
just do this and it works. This is so cool. Now you see the wind is coming from the back, so you can see like this uh, self-tacking, it's closing the sail way too much. You can, even the non-sailor can see something is wrong. So that's why we had this line here to open it. Uh, but yeah, this is really cool. Still six knots. So we're now attaching uh, this rope to the, to the jib. Now there's a couple of holes, right? Uh, you want to put on this one because this one pulls this edge more down. So you close the upper part. If you put on this one, then you're closing more this part and the upper part opens, which we don't want. So for downwind, you want to attach it here. And now we're going to put it down on the cleat. So when you put it on a cleat, it does matter. So you have to go like this from this side around. It just makes more sense. And now we're gonna release uh, the, the jib sheet. And now let's see the magic. Uh, this is beautiful, isn't it? You see now the sail has a shape. It's catching more wind, which is coming from here. And we just increased the sail area. So the uh, light Geno is 100 square meters. This is almost 50, so we have 150 square meters. And it feels so good. Uh, but anyway, so we have 30 knots of true wind speed, eight apparent. So it's only eight apparent wind. And we're doing around five and a half, six. So with only eight apparent wind speed. You can see here how the day winds are changing direction because and also because of the land and the speed slowly started going down because the day is going to the end. But we hope in this channel the wind will accelerate, which always does. So once we get here, the winds uh, should stay around 12 to 15, hopefully to get here by the sunset. So now the question is how much left and right we can go. Okay, now we're 180. Okay, let's go five degrees to this. Okay, now we have 175. So we went and everything should be fine. Yeah, the sails are still stable. Okay, let's go 170. Parent wind angle. So now we have the wind 10 degrees from this side. 170. Yeah. It seems like everything is okay. Okay, let's go five more, 165. So we want to see the limit. So once the Genoa collapses, that's the limit. Now we're 165, everything is good. This is super cool. This is really cool. Yeah, let's go 160. Okay, now this is 160. The Genoa still is kind of happy, the small Jeep, I mean. So why is it? It's because, uh, you know, the code zero has this effect. It's kind of filling the hole. It's like a balloon, you know? So even though the wind is coming from here and the Genoa should collapse, I mean the jib, it doesn't because the code zero has this effect of blowing everything, you know, how to explain this. Okay, we're now on 150, wow. We are 150 apparent wind angle and this still doesn't want to collapse. This is super cool. Oh, see, it's suck. We're actually now 144 because the autopilot messed it up. So yeah, let's go, let's go 145. Seems like that's gonna be the limit, 145. So let's check here, yeah. So now we have winds from this side. We're gonna go 145. And let's see, now the, the Jeep should kind of collapse. But this is super cool. This is like, uh, what, 35 degrees off. See, it's still kind of working. It's, uh, oh, it's not. Yeah, see, this is, okay. But now we collapsed at 140, right? Yeah. So it actually, it actually handled, handled uh, 145. So there's one thing. We're so happy you now, like this is working so nicely. Uh, you don't see any boats in front of you and then you crash into the island. So that's why you have to come here, here and there. 
and check uh, for the boats. So there's nobody on the horizon, so we're good. So once we enter the channel, the angle changed and you can see how much the wind increased. So this is this effect. And uh, actually the strongest winds are here. So we're gonna have all these winds uh, all the way until Korchula. So we, this is a safety. And then we have another safety and then there's two buttons. And all we do is just press. Make sure the rope doesn't get tangled. And this is really cool, this flat uh, winches. And then uh, you go in. Yeah, and it's so easy because you just unclick. Some people use some strange uh, methods, you know, but this is like the best. You just come, clip, clip, see? And it's done. And another thing, I always have a carabine also on this uh, rope from the, you know, from the boat. So now I just clip together. And I can go off the boat, see, so there's no tying, no complication. So putting a dinghy in and out, it's a thing of one minute, clip, 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 and the same to put it out. We are flying, we have kind of the perfect, these are the day winds, and they just picked up and so lucky because there's almost no waves. Uh, the winds just, you know, picked up a lot. We decided to go to this remote island, Susha, it's where usually nobody goes. I haven't spent a night there for the last 15 years. Been just there for the day visit, but really cool, we're gonna spend the night there. Uh, so we're having full sails, main, the jib, and we're averaging eight knots. So we're doing eight knots, we have a parent with angle 16, 60, true wind speed 17, and a parent wind speed 19 because we're making some wind, because of course we go a little bit up. So this is the wind history, so the wind just increased and the angle is changing because it's kind of uh, day winds and we also got away from the island. So the thing was, so the, the winds are like this. But then when they go close to the island, they would, you know, like go alongside, the island will pull them. So that's why the more out we go, the wind is turning like this, to the original direction. Uh, you can see in the history. And this is super cool for us because now we're not sailing like sharp upwind anymore, a little bit less. And this is when these catamarans become fun. So catamarans are fun in these angles. A little bit off wind, 90 degrees, maybe a little bit downwind. Mostly, you know, like from the winds from the side. Once you're going downwind or upwind, it kind of sucks, you know. Uh, although, you know, though going downwind with this code zero, it's a kind of fun. But upwind, these boats are just not, uh, you know, like, they're not really the best. We have anchored in this beautiful bay on Sushats Island. Remote island, there's only a shepherd and a lighthouse keeper. Lighthouse is all the way down, so very remote island. And we made sure that tonight we're gonna sleep well by putting a lot of ropes. So we have two white lines, they are the main ones going to this rock, another one going there to the rock. And then we have two safety ones, which are just normal ones, uh, actually two more, uh, no docking lines, the short ones tied together. And then another two lines uh, going across there. And then we have a 60 meter of chain. So why did we do this? So I always sleep much better if I drop a lot of chain. So we dropped a uh, um, chain at 12 meters, anchor at 12 meters. And right now here it's around 5 meters, so 60 meters sounds just uh, way too much. But, uh, you know, anchor holds, one thing is when the anchor, you know, digs in and holds, that's one thing. But then also the weight of the chain and the, you know, friction and the drag it has on the bottom also adds, you know, to the strength of the, you know, uh, anchoring. So one thing is, you know, anchor, you know, like digs in and holds. But then another thing is the, the friction of the chain. So the more the chain you have on the bottom, you know, the more friction it is. So it's gonna help uh, uh, anchor a lot, you know, not dragging and holding the boat. So that's why whenever I can, I just drop uh, a lot. Passing by these beautiful cliffs and Susha, it's up there, you can see a lighthouse. And you can actually spend a week there. 
you can rent a room and just be here and you know nobody is on the island there's a lighthouse keeper and some shepherds down there a beautiful place uh, you know just to be alone swim enjoy this is now the test for holger he has learned how to use a catamaran but now it's the final test he has to be nervous while putting some pressure on him so now he has to put the sails up he has turned uh, upwind and now he's gonna set a wind autopilot to five green which means we want to have wind autopilot upwind actually not upwind we want to have wind five degrees from this side because we've learned that because the boom lift you see is in the way of the sail when it goes up and then if the wind is a little bit from you know five green uh, the sail will go just on one side of this uh, boom lift otherwise it can get stuck a little bit left a little bit right and then you cannot go up he is now setting the small rope so this rope is actually used to pull the sail down so this rope goes here and is attached there to the to the mainsail and now as we lift the mainsail up this uh, rope is gonna go up with the sail and then we use this rope to help bring the sail down the red rope is now the main sail halyard so this is the rope you can see it's here you know loose so this rope is gonna pull the sail up and you can see the small line it's attached see there to the top and now it's you know so one rope the blue the black one is going out and up and we're pulling the halyard we always start by hand and stopper open because you see the buttons the buttons are these you know hard uh, you know whatever buttons they get stuck in the lazy jack which is the small gray lines you can see a couple of them so if you start by hand it's just easier you know to go through because they could get hooked once the three uh, are like through now Holger has it on uh, electric winch uh, because it would be just too heavy to pull by hand now the critical point to see okay the sail passed on one side of the boom lift and it has to go from this side if it goes on the other side you're gonna have a problem on top because it would have a twist with the ropes would be, you know would cause wear and tear so now holger is probably gonna forget about the main sheet okay because we have to release the main sheet if we want to tension the sail because the main sheet is the see this black rope and if you want to tension the sail in this direction well this has to be loose so you can tension right uh, so oh, stop stop the stopper is not open all the way okay now it's open if it's just up it's still closed and now we can tension the sail little by little now this is a very delicate point you know how much you learn by experience so still more it should be straight and a little bit more you know but overdoing it it just might you know so Volger is looking up and that's why he doesn't realize that the rope is slipping because he doesn't have enough donuts let's press again so you see what happens you see it's slipping so we put another donut and now we're gonna have enough friction to see now it's turning nicely and now also the sail is tensioning yeah maybe one more okay that's it so you don't want to overdo it but then again if it's going to be too loose and once you get a lot of wind everything stretches if you get this kind of you know line like this on the sail you will deform uh, the sail uh, but you can tension this as sailing but of course only by you know depowering the sail when you're full power sailing you know don't pull this it's gonna be too much pressure but you can open the sail depower and then you know pull this up so this was yeah it was pretty good so we have now closed yeah the main sheet is now on the winch so now checking everything this is a good practice so once you've done phase one you just want to visually you know check something might be stuck you might miss something you know there's a lot of ropes ok 
Yes, yeah, so now Holger is gonna clean up this spaghetti mess. See, like sometimes even I, we just put all the thing in, but then when you have to put the sail down, see, you have to release this rope because this is the rope that pulls the sail up, it has to go down, you have to release. If you put it nicely in this way, it's gonna be very easy to release the sail in a panic. If you just put it in like all the spaghetti, something's gonna get stuck. So this is the, you know, a good practice. Although many times we're too lazy to do it, but you should do it. And you can see he has gloves, uh, which are actually too old, they're mine. They're like all the way worn out. So this would happen to your hands if you wouldn't wear. I need to get new ones. Because if you mess it up, your hands start smelling like a chicken because it just burns. So you can see this is taking quite a long time. So that's why many times, of course, we don't do it. We're humans, right? But you should take time and uh, in the end it's gonna, you know, pay off. So now everything is, the main is good. Now we're getting ready to put out a jeep. So you can see two sails. The one in front is a light Genoa, big sail. It's too big for today. So we're opening the smaller one, the jeep. Now, there's two ropes controlling. So now Holger is getting ready with the black line. And this line goes here and down. And it's going all the way to the front. And this is the drum, you see? And the sail is furled, you see? Like it's furled around the stay. So now if you want to unfurl, we have to pull this rope, but also release this one. But then when you're furling, you see, you want to pull this one, you see, by pulling and releasing this rope, you're rotating this sail, either furling or unfurling. And then again, this is the jeep sheet, so-called. So this rope is going to open the sail, but then when you want to close the sail, furl it back, of course, you have to release this one and pull the black one. So when opening, you're releasing the black one, pulling this one, when closing, you release this one and you pull the black one. Now there is a catch. You always want to open, you know, so the main, you always put up and down, heading upwind. Now for the Jeep, you want to have it on the angle, at least 40 degrees uh, apparent wind angle or even more. The best is to go 90 or even a little bit downwind. Why? Because if you open now, the sail is just gonna go fla 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 fla, you know, because you're straight upwind and you're causing wear and tear. Now, just by going a little bit off, the sail will catch the wind immediately and there's gonna be no wear and tear. So we are now changing the direction, going to the starboard. Oh, you wanna go like 40? And we want to put the main in the middle. So we have now set uh, wind autopilot to 40 degrees wind angle, apparent wind angle to this side. So now we are ready. Uh, probably just put on the winch and close Keep it closed and on the winch. We're now putting the jeep sheet on the winch. So now we're pulling and, and you can see the black line always has to go around the winch, at least once, depends from the wind. The stronger, because you want to control the opening. If we release the black line all the way, the sail would go fring bang. So just by, you know, slowly releasing the black line and controlling, the sail opened, you see, beautifully, there was no bang, you know, it was super easy to do it. So this was uh, well done, the sail opened very smoothly. So now we are sailing, we're gonna do the spaghetti and then turning the engines off. And then we're officially sailing with no power, shutting the engines off. So we have the sails up. We have a very nice breeze from like this angle, so we're gonna fly. So the next step is to figure out where we wanna go on the chart, set course, and then uh, adjust uh, the sails. 
So we are, we have to change the course a little bit down because our island is a little bit, you know, lower. So the wind is from here, right? If we change the direction downwind, you have to release both the sails, which means we're going to release uh, this uh, Genoa sheet so the sail opens more. And we've done the same on the main. So we have used uh, this uh, traveler behind. It's actually operated just by these buttons. So let's look. If I press, you see it moves. This is the winch that's controlling. So also we have to open the main more. The more downwind you go, the more you have to open the sails. If you want to go then upwind, of course, you can never go straight upwind. You can only go, let's say, 45 degrees to each side, and then you have to zigzag. If you want to go to this island, which is directly upwind, we would have to go 45, 45, you know, eventually get up there, which is, of course, much longer way than just going downwind, but that's how it is. So if you want to go upwind, we would have to change course, let's say like this, angle 45 to the true wind. And we would have to pull all the sails in. So we would uh, use this winch to pull the jib sheet, you know, and bring the jib in. And the main, the same, we would pull it, you see, more in, center it, and that would be a setting for the main. So the more upwind, the more sails want to be, you know, tension, the more downwind, the more you're opening, opening them. Great speed, we're doing 8.4, and this is not surfing in the way, this is a constant speed. 8.6, 8.4, so whoever said these catamarans are not fun, look at this. We have a 19 knots of train speed, only 18 of apparent. So we could go much more without reefing. See, this is a constant speed. The waves are pretty small. We have full Genoa, full main. And I can say this is fun. And the speed doesn't drop, it's still 8.4. So it's like consistently around 8.4. That's really good. So let's see the wind history. You see, so it went up, now it's coming down a little bit. Uh, because we're getting in this kind of a channel. Uh, so the winds were first like this, and then we came here like this. And then the wind changed to like this, and then are going like this. It's all a fact of these channels and islands. And it's a really good demonstration of how the history looks. So uh, how do we do, how do we put the sails down in strong winds? It's basically the same as in the light winds, except that uh, in the light winds, you know, you can also put the Genoa, for the Genoa going upwind, but now in very strong winds, you want to go downwind. So we are now sailing, um, uh, see at this angle, the wind is from here. So we want to go downwind more, and that is how we're going to reduce the apparent wind speed. We're also going to start the engines already, give a little bit throttle. And uh, if you reduce the apparent wind speed, that means there's much less force on the sail. And if you go downwind, there's much less force to furl the Genoa. Now uh, starting uh, the engines first. See, we're getting pretty close, fast to shore. So you do want to do this a little bit earlier before you hit land. So we have started the engines and we put uh, just in a gear. And now we're gonna go downwind to 150 apparent wind angle. And we're gonna open uh, Genoa a lot. We're just like basically gonna start uh, downwind sailing. Now getting the blue line ready, actually the black line. So this line, we're gonna pull now this line and this line is gonna furl the Genoa. But of course we have to release the other one. So before starting, uh, we're actually gonna open the Genoa a lot because we can do this as we're going uh, downwind. 
and I can already feel because when we're downwind there's much less uh, apparent wind speed so much less pressure for the sails so now releasing getting the spaghetti ready releasing the uh, see this is slipping it's not under control you see this is a bad practice okay so now we are pulling the black line And there is very little force now, so very, very easy to furl uh, the sail. Uh. So now, how many donuts you should have? On the end, you should have only one donut. Otherwise, because you put too much friction and then you have to pull so much hard on the black one. So you see, this was so easy. If we went upwind, uh, it would be way uh, different. Uh, but this was really easy. Now putting the spaghetti away and now getting ready to put down the mainsail. Now for the mainsail, we have to go upwind. And you always check if there's any people in front of the boat, you know, sleeping here because we're gonna turn up to the 20 knots of wind and we're gonna go upwind with the engines, which means the apparent wind speed will increase. And now like to 24, because we're gonna produce wind going up with the engines and people just might get wet of course check uh, the windows and then of course prepare the spaghetti so remember how we uh, made this uh, line very nicely in see now it pays off uh, because it's going to be very easy to put the sail down so now after we turn upwind uh, we're going to release this one this was we were previously pulling it up but now we're going to release it so that the sail comes down at the same time, we're going to pull the fin uh, black line, which is going to help us, uh, you know, at the end of the, you know, once the sail is almost down, to pull the last part. At the beginning, the gravity does most of the job, but once you're almost down, the friction of these wheels can be high, and then you need, you know, to pull a little bit uh, the small line to help you. Yeah, let's turn upwind. So now as we're turning up wind, you can see the boat is not balanced. So right now we're turning super quickly because the main, you see, is pushing and turning the boat because there's no Genoa to balance. We're putting more speed. The more the wind, uh, the more speed on the engines you need. Now turning up wind. So now the wind is pushing the bow downwind, right? So that's why we need a lot of power and force to turn upwind. This is the critical, you know, going from 90 degrees wind to upwind, you do need, uh, you know, a lot of power. So are we gonna put it in the middle behind or... Uh, are we upwind? Yeah. It doesn't seem like. You have to set it, yeah, to zero. Oh, to, yeah. yeah, or five, zero, yeah. And then... Uh, and then put the sail uh, in the middle behind. We're now putting the sail in the middle behind. We are the traveler and we have now set wind autopilot to zero, which means the wind autopilot is gonna go directly upwind. And that's how you see the sail is now empty. There is no wind, uh, no power. And why is it good to use uh, wind autopilot? Because if the wind changes, you know, the boat will also follow. So now releasing this one, but we have also to pull the other one as we go. So it doesn't get tangled. So this is uh, with two hands, it's kind of tricky. It's usually good to have another person help with the small line. So the sail is coming down. Uh, so this is the lazy jack. You see like this blue thing and the lines. And you see the sail is just gonna like fall in, stay there, that's why it's called lazy jack. And now at this part, you see there's no more gravity. So we have to pull the small line a little bit more to put the sail down.
And then once most of the thing is ready, you see there's still a lot of things to do, but the best thing is to turn downwind. Because right now going upwind, we have, you know, more wind, we're going against the waves, everything is bouncing. Uh, but as soon as you can turn downwind, you should turn downwind, go with the waves, you know, it's going to be much less spray, more calm, right? And then you can finish all the ropes, you know, that you have to do. We have turned uh, downwind now, so we're going with the waves and now the boat is uh, very stable. So now we can finish all the small details that has to be done, uh, you know, to get rid of all the spaghetti. I'll open it. So now climbing to the mast uh, to get the halyard because we want to hook the halyard here just so you know it's not causing wear and tear and pulling the sail up. So now hooking the halyard for the cleat and then we gently pull it. You don't want to put too much pressure. If there's a lot of pressure, then it's like a string and it's like bang, bang, bang to the mast. It's hard to slip. So like just enough, you know, to keep it in place. Now we're gonna put uh, the line to the boom. So if you don't put this line, which most of the people don't do, you know, then the boom is going bang, 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 bang on the waves all night. So what we do is we just uh, attach uh, this rope See, we should put this away. This is dangerous, sometimes it gets around. So it could cause trouble, so we'll have to go and put it in the bag. It's not good, but okay, now it's better. So now we are tensioning. See, and now the, you see, this is pulling here, this is pulling here. So now this is very stable and it's not gonna cause any wear and tear. So what's left is we're gonna put these uh, riffing lines inside and then climb up here and close the sail. We don't wanna have the sail, uh, you know, exposed to the sun. So you wanna go up and just, you know, close the cover and your sail is gonna last uh, much longer. We have anchored in another beautiful bay. Well, the sun is very low so the colors are gone but again we have the main line and then the safety one this time in a very nice rock it's not sharp and again on the other side we have two lines so the main one goes there with that truck uh, pull red thing and the safety one you know just in case loose because we don't want to damage it on the rocks and then we have a lot of uh, anchor forward. It was pretty uh, shallow here, so we dropped at around six, seven meters, the anchor. And right here we are on three meters. And we have dropped around 45 meters of chain, which should be plenty. We have 8.6 of true wind speed, 8.4 of apparent wind speed, and we're doing 5.8 going up to 6. So, and we have engines turned off. So let's see the winds here. So they're exactly from the side. And we're doing this because we have this super cool light Genoa and the main. See, with the sides from the side, 
we're doing like you know incredible speed for the speed of the wind and I just love this sail that's why I say this light Genova from Supreme Sails you need this it just works in all the angles Supreme Sails like these guys really know how to do sails incredible what they've done I just love this So yesterday we came here very late and I really wanted to drop a lot of chains so I dropped the anchor all the way on the other side actually where that sailboat is because that sailboat uh, wasn't there. So I dropped a 55 meter of chain all the way on the other side, uh, reversed in and then as usual we put uh, this time three lines. So we have the white one, one side, we have another one on this side and then there is the another one you don't see it's underwater, it's the safety one, the blue one, as the third line. Now, after dropping an anchor, uh, I realized that, you know, anchor is it's kind of in a rocky ground. I could drop less and put it in the sand, but then I have less uh, chain in there. And the sand, you know, it can always, you know, slip if it's uh, too soft. So actually, I drop the anchor all the way on the other side and then attach the anchor with a rope to the rocks. I have never done this. But hey, this is like a really good idea. So the anchor is almost on the other side where that sailboat is. And then I used a 15 meter line to attach it to the rocks. So even if the anchor slips, it's just like I have a rope on the other side. But because the chain goes under the ground and I have a lot of chain, it's never going to lift up, you know, and annoy other boats. Uh, I've never done this before, but it just seems like it works uh, really good. I'll go later in the water and film how I've done it. This is a cool hat, you can see. This is like a Wilson cap. This is actually ventilation holes and this is the rope for, but it looks uh, so cool. Judging a distance from the bow to the shore. Let's take a look here. This looks super close, right? So we are in uh, Stineva Bay. This is a beautiful uh, beach, very popular. And we have this buoy. And it's very hard to get a buoy in this bay because everybody wants to be here and it's too deep to anchor. And actually there was one monohull who wanted to take this uh, buoy uh, but give up. Probably because this is so close. You see from these angles you're just like on the rocks. And this is the thing and it's also at night all these perspectives change. Looking from here you see it just looks uh, very close. So let's go up on the helm so you're like you know, trying to grab a buoy and this is what you see. Okay, this is a GoPro, it's maybe not the best camera, but it's, uh, it's pretty good. It's very close, right? And uh, now we're not sure what the wind turns, are we gonna crash there? You know, it's kind of... Uh, but the thing is, uh, once you get away from the boat and look from the other perspective, uh, you're surprised how much uh, space there's left. So looking from here, like this looks, uh, I mean, really close, right? And then looking there, it's all good, but if the wind changes and we go around, you're like, hmm, are we gonna make it or is it uh, uh, too close? Then at night, everything seems to be much closer than it really is. Okay, so looking at the boat from this perspective, wow, it just seems like there's uh, like almost uh, the whole length of the boat, you see, of space in front. Uh, so, uh, See, there's so much space in front of the boat, but uh, judging the distance uh, from the boat, it just seems like you're on the rocks, but you can see there is so much space here. So now again, you can see like this distance, it's huge. From the boat, it seemed like, yeah, maybe yes, maybe not, but you can see there's a lot of space. But then again, 
You see the buoy is here, so the block is down here somewhere. And if the winds change, well, it might be close. You see, it's really hard to judge. You know, I definitely wouldn't go for a night party and just leave a boat alone here. Probably would be fine. Uh, but yeah, really hard to judge uh, these distances. So now you can see there's a small entrance and then it opens, you know, and there's a big uh, bay inside. A very nice beach. It used to be a cave, but then the, you know, the roof collapsed. Uh, you can do some cliff jumping. It's uh, like a very nice place uh, to visit. But I just hate the crowds now in the high season. Polarized glasses are the must for the skipper because you can see through the water. It cuts the reflection from the surface. So you can see all the rocks, shallows, the reefs. Uh, way way better when I was in uh, Caribbean British Virgin Islands like these glasses were really good I'm wearing uh, this one is from uh, Yulbo. It's uh, octopus lenses I'm really happy with this, but any polarized uh, quality glasses will do these are also photochromatic Which means they adjust the brightness. So when I go inside uh, I can see you know better when I go out it there get darker So they're like uh, photochromatic and polarized at the same time and I, I really like this and it's very important for the safety. And bank. See, they forgot to put off the mooring line and then swing crash there. So, hopefully, now they're not going to crash in our boat. You have to drop it in the water, I cannot take it. The mooring line goes to the bottom. A beautiful day sailing towards Wyss and we have one boat on horizon. So who has the right of the way? You see, we're going this direction and he's going like this. You could say he's crossing us, but actually we're crossing him. So the rule is if we are both on the under engines, of course, right? Nobody's sailing. We're both running the engines. He has the right of the way because he's on the right side and we are on the left side of him. So it's basically just like with the cars, uh, he has the right of the way. So we have to give him way. How do you give him way? There's uh, many options. Like in this situation, he's actually faster, so he's, uh, you know, we don't do, need to do anything. But otherwise, the option one is you reduce the speed. Now the option B is, which is, you know, don't use it always. You can go full speed, but then make sure when he comes close, you know, he's not too close. You don't want to cut him too close. So the best is, you know, to reduce the speed or turn the boat a little bit to the starboard, to the right side, to this side, and then go behind him. So when you're giving away, you should always, you know, uh, leave the boat to go in front of you. You don't want to, you know, speed up and cut. All that you can do if that boat is, you know, really slow and then, you know, it's going to be still far away when you cut him off. But anyway, so uh, it's all good now. We didn't have to do anything. The distance is safe. We have anchored in this beautiful bay here on Island Viz. We dropped 15 meters of uh, chain on 5 meters of depth. Then we have more boats here. Sometimes we get kind of close. So let's check the anchors of all of these boats.
let's go around the boat and see whatever is uh, technical. So this is the Lagoon uh, 46 catamaran. And let's just go, you know, into the details. So this is the navigation light here. And there's another one on the other side. And then we have, you see, another two on the mast. And we also have a flood light. This is just, you know, to put light around uh, the deck if you're working something. We have solar panels. Uh, one kilowatt gives us 20 to 30 amps. Uh, could have a little bit more, uh, but it, these are really good. You see, you can step on them. Nothing is sticking out. So this is, yeah, it's pretty good. So from electrical, we have also the windlass. So this is the anchor. And, and the anchor you lift um, with, the, with the winch. So this is turning and this is electric. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any manual. Uh, so you can stick the handle here, but this is just to release uh, the brake. And then in here, see, you would have this remote. And then you can press, see, up. Uh, okay, now it doesn't work because we have to uh, run the engines. Because otherwise, there is no uh, power. And then looking in here, we have a water tank. This is uh, 600 uh, liters. Uh, which is not much, but we do have a water maker. So opening here, we have a another tank, and then the chain well is underneath here. So this is where the chain goes, and you can see then the windlass uh, on the top. We have a little bit of hose here, uh, just in case we would need. Now opening the third compartment. Okay, we need to unlock these guys. This is where we keep a generator. So this is the uh, Cummins Onan, a really good stuff. You need the generator when you need uh, 220, which means like toasters, uh, air conditioning, or you want to charge batteries, uh, water maker. But otherwise the boat is, uh, this one is 12 volts. So we have batteries, I'll show in the back. It's run on 12 volts. So when you're running a generator, you have 220 in the plugs or via the charger, you're charging uh, the batteries. So now we have the sail, so this is the, you see, uh, a jib. This is a furler, then this is the furler for the light Genova. And that's pretty much what we have forward. Stand-up pedals, I like these holders. And this is the plank. So this plank is, you see, it has this thing. And the wheels on the other side, so we use this to connect our boat to the pier so people can uh, step off and then we put them in these holes so one side fits this one this one there's a third one on the other side depending you know the distance of the pier so then here we have this system for lifting a dinghy which is really good and these new Harkon winches I really like them you see they're flat and then you can you see just go up and down this is really good stuff uh, super easy I like it a lot. And on this side, so this is the water outside shower. Uh, it's great, you know, you just have a swim and then you jump out. See, it's water. And then the, here is the water maker uh, control panel. So you can start the water maker from here. And then the water maker is living underneath here. Let's open this. So we have engine, we have water maker here, batteries. So this is the you know, pressure pump of the water maker. And these are the membranes, these tubes. So uh, this is making a high pressure. It's squeezed you know, through these membranes and then you get uh, a good water. This is the, see the fresh water pump. We have a carbon filter for water maker because you don't want to flush it with the chlorine water. And then here you can see this is the rudder post. See, there are the rudders. They go down through here. And then there's another rudder on the other side and they're connected with this rod. And then in the middle, the cables connect. And then the cables go directly up to the wheel so that you can turn them. Uh, this is the Yanmar engine, really good stuff. A starting battery here and then, you know, switches for the batteries. There's a small light. Now for the engine, you see we have a, this is a gearbox, sail drive. And then uh, you see this is for the cooling water. 
this is the cooling water expander. There's a raw water filter. Uh, this is a muffler. You see, and this is the seacock uh, uh, valve. You know, it's pretty well organized. It's a big engine room. On the other side, we have a second engine. So catamarans have two engines, each in uh, one hull. And also we have uh, batteries here. So we have an engine. This is a starting battery for one engine. And these are the home batteries. So these batteries are used for refrigerator. And you see we have two more and two more in the back. So we have six of these. And this is the 12 volt system of the boat. So we're, it's for refrigeration, for lights, for USB plugs. So basically it's a 12 volt. Uh, this is a bilge pump. So you put a, you know, a thing in and then you're pumping out water manually. But we also have electric uh, bilge pumps on the boat. So going inside, going inside, we're gonna check the, what's uh, under the floor. So opening the floor, here we have, uh, this is the, for water maker, uh, salt water intake. And this is for pickling the water maker because you shouldn't leave it not running for a long time because you would, you know, build up algae and uh, destroy the membrane. It just wouldn't work that good. Oh, so here we have, uh, see the plugs? So now uh, this is working all the time. And this one also works because we have inverter. So up to two kilowatts, you know, like small things, we can run to 20, but otherwise you have to start a generator. Uh, this is the control for air conditioning. And then the, you see, this is where the cold air from air conditioning is then blowing. We also have these uh, electric fans. They're pretty good. Some lights. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Now in here, this is the build pump. And then this hose comes from the peak of the boat and from the engine compartment, so that the water is draining to the bilge pump. And another hose, this is the manual bilge pump you see outside. And uh, if you're in a crashing container, you want to close uh, that valve so that the water, you know, you separate the front of the boat from the rest of the boat. And then you see more hoses, uh, that's where the water comes in for, uh, like, whatever you need or goes out. Uh, this is a black water tank, so the water, uh, I mean, the toilets, go in here and then you can pump it out when you're in the open ocean or in the marina. Let's see here. This one's pretty empty. Okay, so there's more, you see, uh, valves. So coming up here, uh, this is the, so the original panel. So this is uh, like one fuel tank, another fuel tank, water. You can also check the, so the electricity. Uh, so how much uh, power is left. But we use this one mostly for the water. Then we have this one from Victron Energy. Basically it's from the solar panels, but we connect a generator. So generator would have their own panel, but we can control everything from here. So right now you can see that the solar panel is producing to 80 watts. And the load on AC is 42. Well, we don't see the load on 12 volts, but we can see we're charging with 1.6 amps. Now this is our underwater light. We have a radio here. And then this is, uh, let's see again, plugs, another air conditioning controller. This is a VHF, the antenna is on the mass, so this is now used for calling. Uh, we have, uh, you see, this is for Wi-Fi, the router. And these are just the batteries for vacuum cleaning and uh, and uh, pressure washer binoculars. We have this, uh, but not using, so you can connect your uh, computer, so it can work easier. It's just in the way right now. Now we have a kitchen. We have, a, see, a gas stove. We have a, uh, so the microwave oven, a toaster. We have a ice maker. This is the coffee machine. We have a small vacuum cleaner. Uh, this is the fire extinguisher, some lights, you know, for just the ambient. We have this small uh, weather station telling us temperature. We have this, uh, this is for the smoke alarm. We have more fans uh, around there. And then the air conditioning compressors. We have a couple of them. So one is 
Not here, huh? This is the first aid kit. Now underneath here. See, this is where the compressor lives. Underneath here, this is the compressor for air conditioning. And one thing we have three or something of them. Uh, then fridge. Another electric thing. And then this is the fridge. And this is the freezer. We have a small portable radio. And then here we have the control for a lot of electronics. So this is when you turn on the navigation, everything on the bridge. This is navigation lights, uh, flood light, anchor light, uh, lightning, so lights in the, in the rooms. Uh, we have bilge pumps, so you can turn them on manually. This is the water pressure. And this is for the fridge uh, units. Then we have loads of lights. Lights are controlled here with these buttons, so you have no clue which one's which. It could be like we need to put some uh, markers. Going up to the bridge. So this is the winch. You put this handle in here. This one is just manual. See, and then you can, you see, turn the winch and the ropes. The stopper this is the halyard for the code zero. And then here, so this is the chain remote. So pressing this, you're putting anchor up and down. Or you can also use the one in front I showed you. Uh, this is the engine control, so you start engines. Uh, this is throttle, so you put it forward, backwards, you control, you see, like an engine with this. Uh, we have uh, here uh, to control bilge pumps with alarms and underwater lights. And then we have here, this is a compass. This is an autopilot control. You can go standby auto. So you can go left, right, one degree, 10 degrees. And then these are two, you see screens and you can decide what you want to see. You know, just speed depth. This is the wind history. Depth, uh, this is the position. And if you're doing some navigation, tide, so there's a lot of things, this is autopilot screen, which are mostly useless. So I just keep it on the wind and the depth. So that's what's important. And then we have this big screen, which is used for, see, as a chart. You can also control the radio from here, autopilot from here. And then you can just see zoom in, zoom out. I can press here and read the distance from my boat and coordinates of this point. So this is half mile away in the course. And then here I can see the speed or ground seat temperature, apparent wind angle, and I can set whatever I want. So this is basically the chart. And you can see this, what we've been doing uh, during the night. You see, this is the, we anchored here, the night we were here, and then the wind change, now we're here. So we're basically you now doing this turn around the anchor, and anchor is here. We dropped it here, so we can be like anywhere around here. And then this is the, the wheel, you can lock it, so it doesn't turn during the night. We have more uh, stoppers here. These are electric winches. See, fast, slow. Two winches, you can also control the wind handle. Uh, speakers uh, for the radio. And then uh, we have more ropes and pulleys, you see, going up to the mast. Mainsail. Another cool thing this boat has is, uh, so this track behind is for, you know, setting the angle of the mainsail and it's again controlled with this flat winch see so you can just press this and then it turns you see left and right it's super cool and it's very easy and then this is the stopper for the genoa line furling just goes here forward it goes to the drum and then you release or pull if you want to you know either roll or open the genoa a self-tacking system so once you open you know the sail can go on one side or another one and this is a simplified thing. I'm not a fan of it. This is the, so we put here the rope from the big sail from the light channel. It goes around here, through here up to the winch. And then we have these cleats, uh, we have fenders. So we use this, you know, just to close the boat so nobody falls off. Uh, this is where we fill up uh, the tanks uh, for the fuel. So one side, there's two tanks for the fuel. Uh, the fuel tanks are under the Bats in the bat back cabin. Uh, now this is the thing. So in case the cables connecting the rudder 
uh, see and the helm break you can put some stick in open this put inside you know some kind of uh, thing and tiller and remote and steer uh, manually so this is just in case of emergency uh, these are just the vents so the engine can get air engines need a lot of air this is the you can put a rod in here if you want to fish we have a dinghy this is a high field really good stuff aluminium bottom floor it's a Yamaha 24 horsepower really good uh, engine here in the back this is the life raft uh, this is the ocean class eight person so you just put this in the water it inflates in case you sink so you can save yourself Now these cables, it's called shroud, and you can tension them here. So they're actually keeping the mast uh, from not falling. So the mast is just, you know, there, it's a mast support. And then you have one shroud here, one there, and then the front one. So you have three points of attachment, which keeps this aluminum mast in place. I like the roof, you know, it gives you shade. This screen protects you from uh, spraying water and safe. If you want to empty the black tanks, that's from the toilet in the marina, then you use uh, this is, so you put the hose in, you know, pump it out. And to refill water, so either a water maker or you use here. So you open this, uh, just fill up uh, with the hose. When you're in the marina and you know you have electricity from shore, you have a cable and then you plug the cable in here. So this is the 220 connector. And once you're plugged ashore, you have just 220 like in the house all the time. You can run AC, you charge the batteries. We have a grill. Uh, then we have the propane bottles in here. So they're the small ones. You can have also the bigger one, but this is used, you know, for inside, uh, for the propane stove or for the barbecue. This one is also propane. All kinds of things here. We have uh, hoses, uh, flippers. Uh, so this is the cable, we have some tools. Now the cool thing we're using, this is a, like a pressure washer, battery operated. So you put the battery uh, down here, connect to the hose here. And then it just makes a uh, pressure and then you can you know, wash the boat with this. It's a small thing, kind of portable. So this boat now uh, doesn't have the Y attached to the anchor. So that's why you can see the boat is going left and right a lot. So it's swinging and putting more stress uh, to the anchor and if there's another boat doing the same you see they could collapse if you look carefully on our boat we're just like almost looks like on ground because we put the y and we're super steady in these winds see these are our y robes and it's really like keeping us up with minimum you know left and right turning now you can see this catamaran behind he just turns so much, you see it's swinging a lot left and right, putting a lot of stress on the anchor, taking more space. Another reason is also because, uh, as you've seen, the chain doesn't come from the front of the boat, but it's a little bit in. So the leverage is totally different, so it makes it uh, worse. So you can now see the boat is now turning back and it keeps swinging like if you take a look at our boat we are hardly moving you see we just go a little bit left and right but now you can see how their boat you see it's now going to this direction and then it's going to turn back but let's observe so this just produces way more of the movement and if you look at uh, how this boat is made the anchor is attached all the way in front you see, so the pivoting point or like, you know, is all the way in front, like that boat has it here, you see. So it's a total different leverages and this is much better, you see. This is way better and we keep the Y. Uh, but then again, yeah, you can see now this boat, it's turning like crazy, you see. If it was uh, designed like our boat, so having anchor all the way in the front, the boat would be moving uh, much less. But now you can see there's a catamaran uh, coming in and because this boat is swinging so much he's gonna have a hard time you know passing the boat again looking at our boat you see we're super still everybody can go around uh, but this boat is just you see going it's taking the whole bay left and right 
We are sailing, this is Hvar going towards Ball and I have one boat coming out of the bay. You have to be careful, you know, you're going, you think there's nobody, but then the boats pop up out of the base. Now this boat has a right away because it's on our right. You see, it's just like a car. We are both on the engines, so I have to give uh, way to them, like they have the right away. So how do I avoid? I'm just like watching now their speed and they also call it the angle, you see? So if I'm keeping the same angle all the time, I keep my hand like this and it doesn't change, it means we're gonna crash. If the angle, you see, is getting bigger and bigger, that means you're faster. If it's getting smaller, that means you're slower than they are. So you can see now is the question is like, okay, we are a little bit faster. Now the question is if he's gonna keep his uh, way. You know, another thing is when you have the right away like he has, he shouldn't go, you know, left and right. He should co uh, keep his course. If he starts maneuvering now, that's against the rules, okay? Uh, there's another rule saying you have to do everything to avoid the collision. So even if he has the right away and we mess it up, he has the rule, you know, to do everything to avoid collision. So we are faster, he kept his uh, direction. Everything is fine today. So just, you know, to repeat again, if you have the right away, like this boat has now, which means he has the right away, we have to move. He has to do everything to avoid collision if necessary. And also he has to maintain speed and direction. Because if he starts, you know, going left and right, whatever, you know, then I don't know, you know, where to go to avoid him. So let's say we're having a right away uh, right now, you see, and there's a boat which should give us, you know, the way. Now, I want to keep going, you know, as long as it's safe, you know, I don't want to think like, is he see me, he knows the rules, should I go left, right, no, no. I keep my course and I observe him. And then only in the case I see he's going to mess it up, we're going to crash, then I do everything to avoid collision. But until then, I keep my direction because that's the only way that the other boat is going to know what I'm doing. If I start going left and right, that guy is going to be confused because he has to give me the way, but he doesn't know where I'm going to go. We have a new boat coming out, so then, then there is a sailboat which is going like this. And you can say, again, it's a collision course, so it's pretty far. So now we can expect, you know, anything. He might, you know, sometimes it's good to assume where he wants to go, you see? Because it makes sense that he's just going to cross and go towards split, you see? That makes sense. Also, it makes sense that he's going to turn around and go to ball, although he would be already turning. So that's why I'm just assuming that he's going to, you know, probably keep his course uh, going towards split. So how to figure out his speed? Well, the boat speed is determined by the length of the boat. So if it's the same size of the boat as it's uh, your boat, you know, our boat and their boat is similar length, you can also, you know, assume we have a similar speed. And then you're watching an angle, you see? Now, if this angle is not gonna change, then we're gonna crash. And as you said, if it's going like this, he's gonna go in front of us. If it goes like this, he's gonna go behind of us. Now, what should I do? So, we're getting more and more close. So, I'm gonna take a couple degrees to my starboard just to show him that I see him and he shouldn't be, you know, worried. So, I'm taking 10 degrees. So, I'm going 10 degrees to my starboard. And now if he is carefully observing me, now he knows that I see him and that I want to pass, you see, behind him. If it's necessary, you see, I'll go a couple more degrees. See, it's looking pretty close. So I'll take 10 more. You should do, you see, these uh, maneuvers very early. Just, you know, to show him that, uh, you know, what is your intention. But then he should move his direction. Or many times you change, but then he changes. And okay, he's moving, he's gonna move, so I'm just gonna, you know, change my direction. He has to move anyway. No, he has to maintain his course as I'm avoiding him. And you can see that he's going a little bit, you see, now he's turning, you see? This is like what you should not ever, ever do. You see, he just turned directly on me.
So these are the two islands. This is the channel. The wind squeezes here and accelerate just in this area. So up there, no wind, and down there, you see also much less wind. Uh, but that's why it's good, because the waves don't have time to develop, so it's, you know, like a beautiful lake sailing, and that's what we like. So just gliding, not rocking. So we have this situation, so there is a monohull, and he's getting uh, slowly towards us. So, so what are the rules now, you see? so. The rule number one is he is overtaking us. How do you know? It's because he was behind and now he's getting forward. So the boat who's ever overtaking the other boat uh, shouldn't, you know, interfere. So they have to give uh, way to us. Now, if they would be coming, you know, and they're on our left, so which means we're on the right. And that's another rule gives us the right away. So he would be coming, you know, from this direction. Again, we would have the right away. But right now, is because he's overtaking, he has to give us the way. So it's just you no know, confusion, he's getting closer and closer. It's a really bad seamanship, you see? Like he should, you know, steer away, go more, you know, a little bit to his port. So they're still getting closer and closer for no reason, pretending like nothing is going on. Overtaking and getting too close and it's not, this is not an autobahn, you know. We're on the sea and this is way too close. See, so there's nobody around. Uh, so, yeah, I can already see what they're eating and drinking. So, it's kind of funny. Well, but that's how it is around here. A small uh, traffic jam. See, this guy at full speed obviously doesn't go. He's still not stopping. Really bad seamanship. Now that guy is turning, you see, this is not an autobahn, we're on the sea. And this guy, you see now that guy in the catamaran, you know, slowly turning. The wind's gonna push him. This guy came too fast, too close. See, on the sea you have to look forward and, and think five minutes in advance. Boat is ready for the guests to arrive. A little bit of decoration of lights and makes a very nice ambient. Looking really good. Okay, we're gonna get the uh, boat ready. So we just got it as we got it. We have to check how it is and uh, go out. So the first thing we put electricity off. So we have to figure out which is our cable. You always unplug it first from shore because if you unplug it from there and it falls in the water, you're gonna get a hair like this. So first you put it from the shore and try to coil it. And when you put it here on this pier, try to put it so nobody's gonna fall off. And then you can just pass it to somebody. Just make sure this thing doesn't go into the water. So I would like pass this one first to make sure and then go back around. Okay, and then I will disconnect it from here. So I have to turn, twist, pull out. Oops, these things come out sometimes. Put it back on. Like these things, they would fall off and people would lose them. It's not the best design. No, it's okay. It has to be like real. We'll fix this later. Just gotta go. Okay, and then we put this somewhere safe because you don't want these to get salty, of course. So we put it safe in here. Now we check uh, the ropes. So you don't know what the you know previous uh, captain did. You can see there's like three lines. I have no idea why there's free. So you just start slowly going through. So you want to check what's going on before you go, you know, because once you're leaving, it'd be a mess. So get the boats ready first, okay? So we can see we have this line for no reason, and then the second line. So we're gonna undo it from there. So 
So they made a bow line, which is uh, just fine, correct. Put it twice around. Interesting, interesting method. Uh, there's got to be a reason. And then, uh, so we have winds from there. So this is going to be the last line. Just want to make sure that once we release, you want to check the knot, you know, what was done. Uh, okay. You see, people go like this and then they go across immediately. And this is not good because it puts too much force. So you should always go full and then zigzag. It's just something that most of the people do wrong, putting too much stress. So let's check the other rope. Now the rope here is, uh, the rope is just coiled around just to look good. So make sure, you know, this is like, takes a long, long time. So you want to make sure you get this ready. Again, we're going to check the, the knot. See again, the same mistake. You should always go like this, not across immediately, but full turn under. So it's not perfect as we've said. Uh, because there's a bowline. Actually, it's a very strange. It's not even a bowline. Some strange knot. So I'm gonna change this as soon as uh, uh, we do that. Right. Another thing we check for the fenders how the knot is. So sometimes people make. I already changed this to the good one. People sometimes just do something, and then you're gonna lose a uh, knot. So make sure that the skipper before you made a good knot or just do it uh, yourself. So now because the winds are going in, once we release the boat, we're going to crash into this one. So I want to do another uh, fender in the back. So I'll get one big one. So we don't need this one here, but we can use an extra one on that side. It's a good idea to always put a lot of fenders. There's never too many fenders. So I already know that once I take the ropes off, I'm going to twist the boat with engines, you know, like this. So I'm going to hit this on that boat. So I just you know, want to protect this area, which is going to be vulnerable. So I put the fender here. And we have another fender there, so we should be well protected. Okay. So then uh, I'm going to turn on the instruments uh, for navigation. So there's a panel, there's just a button I press. And I'm checking all the windows, making sure people close the windows, and especially this one here. You want to close this one. For some reason, people you know, keep opening it because it's hot, but then you forget and you go out, you think it's closed, but it's not closed and you get water in. So we'll close this and make sure all the side windows closed. And then uh, everything fragile. So this is a good thing. If you don't know where to put, uh, keep it here. If it breaks, you know, it's a sink, but don't leave it here. The big boat comes, just the common sense. Are we all on the boat? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're all good. Okay. I made it back. Okay. So we're all on the boat. We'll start the engines now. So I started the instrument just earlier with a button. Uh, I got the map ready. Starting one engine. Starting. Uh, okay, you see there's like something uh, not good, which means that the guy who was checking the uh, the guy, the engineer, was checking the engine, put the switch off. So they do these things uh, sometimes just for fun. So there is this button, emergency stop. And they, uh, all the time, they put it off, you know, just to make fun of the captains. Uh, but it's dangerous because, uh, but it's good to know it's there. Now let's see the engine should start now. Yeah, 
Okay. Okay, now it started. We're good. So the next thing uh, we want to check. Okay. We want to check if there's any ropes in the propeller. Well, so we have these uh, mooring lines. So always check, you know, that there's no ropes in the propeller before you start. Okay. And then the next thing is you need to check if the engines are working properly. So we've talked about cables breaking. So before I go out, always check. I put forward, you see the boat moves forward, moves backwards, so it's okay. Sometimes it breaks, whatever you do, it goes forward because the cable of the gear broke. Let's see the other one. Okay. Okay, so always check this. And that's uh, how also you know that there is nothing on the propeller because you don't want to go out and figure out there's something on the propeller. It doesn't work. So we can now release this spring line. Actually, I'll keep it because I want to do one trick. Not much wind now. So on these cleats, if you do this method, you can come here closer. And if something gets stuck, I hope we don't go. Is it is gonna fall off? Probably not. I'll go very quickly. So this is like a really bad method when people do this. This is like the worst ever you can do. Okay, so I'll do like this. And the second one over. Uh, because if, if uh, this line gets stuck there and you have a bow line on the cleat, you won't be able to release the rope. If you tie both of them, then the second one you can just release and go and you save the boat. Uh, so this is a good trick. So we'll... And I don't know what kind of knot this is anyway. It was not. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not knot. It's a knot, it's a but it's not a knot. It's not nice. <laughs> So the knot should be strong, but easy to undo. So this is definitely not good. But most of the people do that, so now we're ready. So in case we untie, we pull, the rope gets stuck there. You know, we cannot go out. We'll just untie the another one and leave the rope and save the boat. So we'll do another, uh, the same on the other side. I'll just put this rope here. Because once you release these ropes, the boat goes forward. So just quickly attach the boat and do the same on this side. So always take time, you know, preparation. See, this is like, if this rope gets stuck, see, you won't be able to put this off. Even, even now it's kind of, okay. Now our board is gonna fall off. Hopefully not. Okay. Uh, could you just move the board a little bit so it doesn't fall? Thanks. Okay. Now again, this knot is... It's not a knot, this is... So thumbs down for the previous... Previous captain. Okay. okay. It's ready. Okay. Okay, now this is set. Now we can remove remove the springs. This one. And up. Oh, ah, thanks. Hopefully you have to check the board. Sometimes they fall off when you release the lines. Okay. And now this one. Okay, this one say so always remove the ropes. If you keep it here, it's definitely gonna fall in the water in a propeller. So when you're in a hurry, just grab it. See, 
put it somewhere safe and nobody falls off and you know forget it. You see the board? Once you start removing the lines, the boards like to fall in the water. Lucky this time. Okay, coming through. Thank you. Okay, this is a great, uh, great holders. Okay, so now I check the mooring lines. So one here, one there. You know, usually we don't put it here. So like, uh, no, double check. You might forget a mooring line that you didn't expect. You just throw it in the water. See the knot here. It's also like way too much. Okay, preset, preset the next one. Okay, so we now the mooring lines are ready, lines are back are ready, the electricity is removed. Check the engine. Uh, we have the fenders where we need them now, checking the wind. The wind is from the back, so that's quite easy to go out. So I'm gonna use now two crew members to help me because it's easy for me. So these lines. They go with us, they're ours. Yeah. So all you do is you undo one end and pull the other one up. It's easy, right? Yeah. And then we always remove the rope from the cleat all the way. So it's not hanging here, it goes in the propeller. So you remove and just put it there, okay? Well, yes. So you can do this one and then... Uh, and then forward we have two mooring lines. I'll show you now. So this line, this is a mooring, you know, my training mooring. It stays here, so it's attached to the pier. The small line goes here, so this end goes there, and this one goes to the block. So this one you undo, throw in the water. It's very important that it's not hanging on the boat on the propeller, but this is not our rope. Undo, shook. So because we have winds from the back, uh, you're gonna get ready on this one first, and when I say tuck, you're gonna put them in. Make sure, you know, they fall in. And then you can go on the back, remove those lines, and we go out, okay? And I have to keep an eye on the other boats because you're so focused on what you're doing and you want to go out, and then there's a boat coming here and there's a mess, okay? That's my job. Yeah, so we get ready on the ropes. Double check, looks good. Put the steering wheel in the middle. Lock the wheel. I can also put the camera here, reverse camera. Uh, they're not the best, but you know, it's better than nothing. And because I'm going on that side, I want to have that camera. Okay, are we ready on the mooring lines? Okay, let's drop them. Yeah, just put it all the way from the cleat, yeah, and drop it in, yeah? Just drop it, drop it, perfect. Thank you. Good job. Okay. And now I have to control, because I have no forward lines, the boat might go backwards, right? But because I have winds from the back, they're kind of pushing me away from the pier. Yeah, we can remove the lines in the back. See, now I don't see anything, right? That's the problem with these boats. Would they go with us, yeah? See, it's kind of annoying, because I don't see what's going on. Okay, so this one's good. This one, okay. Almost. Okay, it's gonna be ready. And now actually there's some wind shift. The wind just shifted. So you can see that I'm actually just moving out. And there's no boats. Thank you. So you see, now I'm just going out without doing anything. It's super easy to exit. Always double check people remove the ropes from the steel wet from yesterday. I'm just gonna, you know, like swing the boat a little bit. Nobody's coming. Go forward. Now these catamarans are very because because the rudder is uh, in front of the propeller. They're kind of like a tank. 
So what I'm doing is I have one hand on the throttles because this, you know, doesn't do much at low speeds. So I just put more speed or less speed on this one to turn the boat and also helping a little bit with the wheel. So this is the technique you want to do. Use both when going out. When docking, usually I lock the wheel, but we're maneuvering at low speeds. You see, I use both and I want to go there. So I go more speed here, see? Or I go like this, more speed, and then you can maneuver the boat uh, really well. So we're now exiting the marina. Now always make sure that somebody doesn't just pop out because somebody else might not be watching uh, other boats. He's just you know focused on his ropes and he might crash. Like the boat forward, you see? There's a boat coming out. We can film that boat. You see, it's like with a car, it's a dead corner. So you have to go really slowly uh, to make sure, uh, you know, the boat doesn't come out like this. Another good trick, so I'm waiting for the fuel station. And there's this big uh, yacht there, and then this catamaran is waiting. And so the wind is coming from that direction. Now, uh, the catamaran uh, is it behind us is basically facing uh, upwind and we're facing downwind you see we're turned uh, the opposite and that's a good trick because it's way easier to control the boat uh, you know and use uh, less engines because the engines are on the back of the boat so i just keep them see reverse and because reverse they're a little bit less efficient than forward just because of the shape uh, i just can see like the boat is just stable i'm not doing much so you're just floating on the other hand that catamaran the bow gets blown left and right so it has to you know uh, uh, adjust the boat much more and also i have the rudders now facing upwind so basically my bow is just like you know pushed uh, kind of downwind and you see i'm not doing it much and then uh, when i want to you know correct the boat a little bit i just put one neutral keep this one here and then the boat is slowly going to move here so basically this is a very good uh, trick because you're gonna use uh, much more you know much less work and much less wear and tear on your boat uh, than uh, the catamaran there because he has to use it uh, see much more see his bow just gets blown off but because we're facing reverse you know to the wind uh, we have the propellers pulling us upwind and the uh, rudders so our bow is pushed off wind uh, which is great because we want to have it uh, downwind so it's a very good method we stopped here on last a beautiful small port not used much these days and so the problem is that well, it's a great place, but the problem is, you see, the day winds are coming in, they're picking up and they're going directly inside. So what we did, we have one rope here and you want to have this rope as long as possible. You see, if this rope would be attached like just here, you see, then uh, the forces are not good. You know, you want to have this very long, you know, as much as forward as possible. And then we have another spring line, see, kind of holding the back also forward. And then the very important is to put these uh, fat fenders. So I've put all the fat fenders on this side and then, you know, the boat is kind of uh, rolling. So we're not going to stay here for long. Uh, we're good for now. But in case we get too big waves, you know, the boat starts jumping too much, uh, then we're just going to, you know, go away. But for now, uh, we're just okay here. So that's a great example why these uh, fat fenders are good. You see, when the boat is moving, see now the fenders are rolling but if you only had the skinny one then it would be you know rubbing up and down so that's why it's good to have a lot of these so we have four on the boat and i've put them all here so they're kind of equally you know pushing the boat around away and you have to be careful because you know if it's a lot of pressure these things can blow out so it's good to have you know more of them in case you know something goes wrong so you can see how nicely it's rolling so if you get uh, bigger waves you know going up and down it's rolling but if you see if you have just this skinny one let's see here you see then it's gonna be you see like rubbing you know and when it's under the pressure you see it's basically doing a lot of friction you can you know damage your nice boat uh, just cosmetically damage of course and then we have two more fenders here see they're nicely working also important thing is uh, you know the shape 
how good shape the, the pier is. You see, if it's very rough, you know, it can damage your fenders. Uh, this one is like, okay, not the best, but the more smooth it is, you know, the better it is. So this is an old pier, but it's in a pretty good shape, luckily. So let's take a look here. See, it's not too rough, you know, sometimes you can have things sticking out, you have to be careful sometimes, some cleats. So make sure, you know, that this face is nice and smooth or just, you know, protect your boat. Another good thing is about the fat fenders, see, they keep much bigger distance away from the pier. Uh, because if there is, you know, that, uh, you know, ring on the, like this, small ring and big ring, uh, if you go just with a skinny fender and the boat pushes very, you know, a lot in, uh, the fender will squeeze and then you can, you know, crash into this ring and just make a hole in your boat. So that's why I always have plenty of these fat fenders. I would say four is minimum, uh, but six would be even better. So this is the line in the back and you can see it's very long. It's mostly because, uh, you know, there is no other space to, you know, tie a boat to. But having a long lines is very important when you have a lot of waves because then, you know, the ropes stretch more. Uh, if we, you know, in this case, had a, you know, like a cleat here and have a very short rope to the same in front, you know, then the rope wouldn't stretch and it would cause, you know, very high uh, forces on the boat and it wouldn't be efficient, efficient, you know, holding it forward. So that's why, you know, these springs are good. You know, like a perfect right now would be, you know, having a rope from here, you know, and then taking it all the way forward to that cleat. Or just if there was another one, you know, taking from the middle, you know, if you say spring, take it here. And then it's basically taking, you know, all the force that the wind is producing backwards. Now, if this cleat uh, here, actually, I don't know how this is called in English, is moved too much in, you see, then the boat is pulled forward and inside. So basically, the more angle it is inside, the more the boat is also pushed uh, against the pier. So that's why these springs are used. So you put it there on the cleat and have a very, very small angle, you know, and then tie it here somewhere. And when this rope, you know, is holding the boat, it's basically only pushing it forward, not also into the pier. This was an old military port, but now it's just a beautiful lagoon for swimming. Just look at the water. Here's our boat again.
This is the funniest boat ever. The small one. A small dinghy. Another example of I don't care about my dinghy. This is the banded anchor, so you can see what happens. I see the anchors look uh, very strong, but uh, when things go wrong, they just bend. So that's why you need a good anchor, appropriate size. Now this is too close, you see? This is another example, like way too close. This guy is getting really close to the moorings. That's really close. He just might get himself hooked. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not good. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's officially hooked.